guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs, they have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. There's a table talk panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate. We are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. Live. Yep. What's up, guys? We're back with another episode of Table Talk. Today, my guest is Brett Contreras. I got a list of things that I can use as your social proof and credibility. But where I want to start is I've known, I met you, talked to you forever ago, like two decades ago. Mm -hmm. And it was exactly two decades, yeah. 2003. And I spent the last three days stalking you. And I am I think the way that you'd want to be introduced is you are an athlete, meathead, bodybuilder first. You know, secondly, you're a personal trainer and coach. And then third, you're a scientist. So I want to use that as the jumping off point because everything that I've seen over you from the years supports that more than everything else. So now when we circle back in there and say, you know, you have a PhD, you've written three books, you got 50 published peer review studies, there's it's just more shit. The NSC, I'm trying to go without looking to see how good my memory is, right? The NSCA CSCS with distinction and the glute lab and the inventor of, I'm putting this one last because I want to hear the rants about that one. The um, When we first started talking, it was when you ordered a home gym. So you've had some kind of home gym glute lab type thing forever and I remember talking to you when you were doing, I don't know if it was EMG or what kind of, you had like a million different studies, testing everything in your garage. You were still a teacher, I believe, at the time. And to see where you've come over the years is, it's a testament to what I just said, being the athlete, then the trainer, and then the scientist, because you don't last, you know this, anybody that's been around, you don't last this long in the industry if you don't have the ability to communicate with all three of those sectors, right? And that was, as I was stalking everything, that was the most impressive quality that I saw listening to you on all these different podcasts is you have a very advanced and great ability to understand the audience that you're speaking to. If it's a podcast that's only got 12 views, and I was one of the 12, or it's probably 13 now, or one that's all scientific based, or one that's all meathead based, you're right there knowing exactly who the audience is. And that's rare, man. That's not something that you see often, if ever, in this industry. So that's my compliment to you and the introduction to you is that. Now, we can't go without saying that you, yes, you did invent the barbell hip thrust. I don't know the controversy behind that. I just heard through these things that some people are trying to say that you weren't. And I'm trying to say, I was kind of like around during that time. And you're being very fucking modest about some of this stuff. Yes, you can curse on this. Because what they don't know is the bullshit you had to take. That the what they call today is hate, right? Whatever it was, criticism. Oh my God! It was. If people now get offended by like four negative comments in an Instagram thread that are like, eh, 
dude had like thousands of this is bullshit, this is bullshit, this is bullshit, nonstop for years. And you just, you just kept sticking with it. And now if you look at glute training across this board, it's become part of almost every training program in some degree or another. And it started with, and I'll let you talk more on this, like the activation type of stuff, which everybody kind of knew of, but I don't think anybody was thinking of the strength aspect. Louie was trying to tell us you need stronger ass, you need a stronger ass or reverse hypers and all this other stuff, then your lower back gets pumped. And you can hardly drive home because the lower back's so pumped because of this. And the loaded hip thrust that you should and do have all the credit for that, I think people need to be aware that wasn't an easy road to walk for somebody at your age at the time that's new in the industry, just getting fucking blasted by, do I wanna say elders in the industry? Cause I, I wanna say more advanced people in the industry, but I don't really know thinking back if they really were more advanced. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They thought they were like Dooney Kruger. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you see that time period? So you touched upon some some topics I'd like to talk about. Mm -hmm. Louis, Louis, kind of, if, <clears throat> you know, I've I've learned a lot by reflecting, you know, down after I invented the hip thrust. I've learned a lot about the history. For example, in the nineteen twenties, uh, that's how bench press came to be. They would do f like a pullover and press because they didn't have benches. And you, you just, it wouldn't be like a total pullover. You just had to get the bar over your face mm -hmm. and then you'd press it. And then people would realize I'm stronger if I bridge up, kind of turn into decline. And then people would start catapulting it with their hips and catching it the lockout. And then some guy came along and he's so flexible, kind of like modern day Benji, yeah. but he would just bridge up, bridge up, bridge up, bridge up, arch, 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 and then catch the bar at lockout and then lay back down. And then that's when people realize this is ridiculous. I kind of remember some of that because they, they had to change it. That's when the powerlifting rules started to change where your ass had to stay on the bench. Well, but this was before a bench <laughs> Yeah, we even around. before that, yeah. But yeah, so, so that, but pe people would just do one rep, one rep of that. But you could say 1920s people did barbell glute bridges, mm -hmm. but it was for bench press. Yeah. Then you see in, in the book Super Training, you know, don't you miss those days when everyone read the oh, classics? Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. But yeah, we all, all the strength coaches read Super Training. Well, there's a picture from 1978 from Yuri Verkoshansky with variations of hip thrusts. They're all single leg hip thrusts, but they'd put a kettlebell on the opposite leg and like hang from something, put their foot on like a pommel horse and mm -hmm. then bridge up. And they talked about how that would be a, like specific to sprinting because it's a horizontal vector and you've got load on the opposite hip flexor, you're doing hip extension on one side, hip flexion on the other. And then there's just little, like, you know, in 2003, before I came along, I never saw this until years later, there's a clip of Beyonce doing uh, barbell hip thrust off of a, a stability ball and she must have like a 15 pound barbell. She's just doing little pumps with her chest yeah, arch. Yeah, yeah. But I'm going, if you wanted to, you could credit those people for, um, also, I have this book I, that my cousin got me when I was 19 years old. It's called something like The Complete Guide to Button Leg Development or something like that. Um, and they don't, sh they, they show pelvic bridges, but in the programs at the end, they say weighted pelvic bridges, but they don't say what that means. But it's kind of funny. That was in 1995. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's, you know, there's people along the way who had, I remember talking to Bert Soren. He's like, I was doing that with a band in, in when I was training for, um, he, he was a thrower. Yeah. And he's like, I was thinking about how I could get that horizontal vector, but I never thought of putting a barbell in my lap. But the point is, I thought of it on my own. I was watching UFC fights, uh, Tito Ortiz versus Ken Shamrock, you know, it was, uh, uh, their third fight and I didn't care who won I just didn't want 
it to end so quickly. Yeah. But I, that's when I started thinking, why don't they, some guys they'll get, you know, mounted or side mounted, or, you know, they don't try to escape, they just lay there. Why don't they try to bridge up? Why don't they try to explode up? Because I had an identical twin brother. We'd always, we'd be bucking like a Bronco. So I thought maybe there's an exercise that could strengthen that. Well, back then, I don't think I would have thought of this if, remember the T-Nation days mm -hmm. with Cressy and Robertson and um, and all, all these coaches basically talking about glute activation. And I remember getting down on the floor doing glute bridges. Like, you really feel the squeeze. Yeah. But I don't want to do, I want to do, as a bodybuilder, I want to do things to fatigue. I don't want to do a set of 10 when I could do 100. I want weight. I want yeah. load. Yeah. So when I thought about this exercise, I thought, what is the glute bridge, the floor bridge lacking? Well, range of motion and load. So I went out to my garage, which was all your equipment. No, I remember. <laughs> and I had, the re I had the reverse hyper. I had the glute ham developer. And I put them near, but near each other. I put my feet on the reverse hyper my back on the glute ham developer, the rounded pad, s sunk my hips down, thrust it up, put a weighted dip belt underneath me with four plates. And I remember just sinking down, thrusting up, and it was so awkward to get into. But I did a set of like 15, and I remember thinking, I, I have to stop, I feel like my glute, I'm gonna pull a glute muscle, and I'd never felt that way before. And so that's when I was like, <laughs> it's funny how your goals change over time. Back then, my goal was to write for T Nation mm -hmm. because all, all the big shots wrote for T Nation back then. So I was like, I'm going to write about this. But then I'm like, wait, how many, what percentage of the population have a reverse hyper and a good hand developer? <laughs> yeah. And what if they split <laughs> apart while you're doing it? You would fall and like crack your yeah. tailbone. So I was telling my aunt, who, whom I was training at the time, and she's like, well, sounds like you need to invent something. So that's when I invented the Scorcher, but then I, I partnered up with business partners that fell through. And then it was just a long line of, I mean, basically when the housing market collapsed, gyms went under, yeah. you know, and so I had a gym called Lifts in Scottsdale. And that's when I was like, okay, I need to, people are all telling me, Brett, you should be writing for men's health. You should be, you should be the fitness expert for News Channel 3 or 10 or, you know. I'm like, I don't know how to, I don't even know how to do any of that. Well, and they're like, you should have a blog. And I was like, God, blogging sounds so lame. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you should be on social media. Well, that's when I thought, you know what, my whole plaza was going under. And I'm like, this would be a good time to start writing. But I need a moneymaker. If I'm going to be blogging all the time, I need something to sell. So I'm not wasting all this time. So I wrote an ebook. And that's when I was like, I need to teach people how to do this without this big clunky machine. So we had never done barbell hip thrusts from a bench. <laughs> we always used the scorcher. Yeah. That's when I thought, oh, we just use a bench. It didn't feel the same, but uh, y y you didn't feel as much hamstring. Y it was less hamstring, a little more quad. But I'm like, this is great. You could do it anywhere. And, you know, the, the key for me was, uh, I remember thinking, okay, I can't just have a bar in your lap. It's got to be padded or it hurts. So I, I remember Googling thick bar pad for like barbell pad and Hampton came up. <laughs> Hampton sold this thick yeah. bar pad. And that was the, that was the key to being able to do heavy barbell hip thrusts. And, you know, we had people doing 405 back in the day. Now people are crazy with it, but back Back then, it was like, you know, women doing 225 and 315. And for high reps, it was it was really impressive. And so that's when I started writing. I started blogging. And back then, it was kind of a different... It was, it was a fun era while it lasted before Facebook came up with their algorithms and everything. Yeah. Because you would film a YouTube video. Uh, and it was one take. We didn't edit those. It was like, you'd have your mom or your girlfriend, or your training partner just film. Mm -hmm. Hey, can you film this? And, you know, it was one take. You'd be running across the gym, grabbing dumbbells and out of breath. But we'd film a YouTube video. You'd embed that YouTube video in your blog. You'd post your blog. You'd choose a, a thumbnail or whatever. And then you'd then copy the link, post that to Facebook and Twitter, and then send it out to your newsletter. Mm -hmm. And that was just what we did three, four or five times a week. And you were always on your computer working on your blog. 
and then it the world changed you, you went from all of a sudden you know you'd post a blog and it would get three thousand likes and and 500 shares to now it's getting 300 300 likes and 50 shares it's like divided by 10 and i was kind of the first guy to say this is stupid this is this i'm i'm annoyed i spent all this time on facebook we're you know building up my popularity and now it's stupid and twitter the all the people following me were scientists and i love scientists in our field but they discount anecdotes too much like uh they you you there's only so much you can learn through reading yeah you know you have to be doing and so you post something and they'll say evidence for that as if your only evidence can be from a random randomized controlled trial like i can't make a claim unless i've got like you know a meta-analysis or like a review paper summarizing 10 studies it'll never happen it won't exist in our field so i was like i'm getting bored of twitter bored of facebook my twin brother at the time was like brett instagram's the way of the of the future join instagram i'm like how you can't link it's like snapchat to me it's like pictures i don't know how i can monetize it i'm a businessman i'm not here to post pictures of my face he's like just trust me and i did and i went all in on instagram like all in i quit youtube i quit facebook i quit twitter i quit blogging i quit my newsletter and focused all put all my cards on instagram and that's where i started crushing it and i got in before the algorithm changes and i think i'm lucky for that i'm lucky to get in during the teen nation era when it was everyone wrote for one main thing now mm -hmm. you know in the men's health the men's health era where you actually to be in men's health you had to have own a gym or have a master's yeah. degree or you had to, people had to vouch for you they didn't reach out to you unless you had actual expertise but back to louis louis was doing horizontal hip extension stuff and i think it goes along with the band training it's like this the gear will help get you out of the hole but you've got to lock it out and so that's why bands and and chains came into play so much but also strengthening the lockout strengthening the shortened position so think about all the accessories he was doing for glutes. It was back raises, it was reverse hypers, yeah. <clears throat> cable pull throughs. And to me, the hip thrust is just a much more stable cable pull through, you know? That was a um, man, you hit so many different areas. I know, there. Sorry. So fast. So, but there's a lot of them I want to touch on where I'll just start with when I when I came to the West Side, that was because I had 10 years competing before that, you know, more linear, but I could say block, but I can also say linear block and conjugate. It's all the fucking same. It's all, you know, semantics when you get down to it. Everything's linear. Everything's block. Everything's conjugated. It's just how you want to go about defining it. And but I was following more Western methods, straight strength, power, P, yeah. you know, that type of hypertrophy phase. And Louie had this ridiculous emphasis on glutes, which is kind of weird, you know, nuts. Not as weird as what you got. I mean, you got like kind of almost like creepy weird, but then it was like, well, I kind of see what's going on with this whole thing. And um, but I remember walking and he's like, your, your quads are too fucking big. You know, and your hamstrings, you know, they're okay, but your glutes are flat as fuck. And I'm <laughs> Like, well, why do you care you know like why do you fucking care for one thing and but that's when the 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 focus he would put on the top of the reverse hyper you know you shouldn't be arching you should be flexing the glute. well we had a flex glute day and an arch day so a heavy day a light day um glute ham raise you know at the top you know he'd be punching people in the ass that needs to be contracted dimmel deadlifts you know the short mm -hmm. type of deadlifts we used to do kneeling squats where there became a problem with that because the load becomes so fucking high that what are you gonna this this doesn't it's not practical mm -hmm. and what what if something goes wrong I at know. the bottom you know it's bad that happened to me once <laughs> you, you unrack it and then you do your set and all of a sudden you're too short to rack it. What do you do? I was so scared. I was sitting there for like <laughs> three minutes with the bar going, what, I, do I fall forward? It could take my yeah. head off. Do I go backwards? What if it hits my low back? Yeah. Yes. Now I always set the safety pins yes. up. The, um, but the scorcher, I remember talking. Do, are you, do you have freedom to speak about yeah. that? There's no NDA mm -hmm. or any crap no. like that. No. Um, I remember speaking to you about that from the jump because you called me we were talking about it and i actually had one you sent me yeah. one 
and I'm looking at it, and it's like, okay, the footprint's fucking too big. The shipping on this is going to be a motherfucker. Yeah. Everything that ends up being true with it ends up being true. And then it was it was a banded thing, right? Yep. And it's, God, I had it. Until we came into the place, I still had it. You know, when we came into this place, then I gave it to somebody that promised that they wouldn't get rid of it. Right, because it's it's one of those things it's that classic. it's a cla <laughs> it's a classic. It really is, and it was it was in my gym for so fucking long because I don't think you know that when you ordered that first order, I was still working out of my house in my spare bedroom, right? So when we were talking about this scorcher thing, like I uh, put it in my garage, like what, what, where the fuck am I gonna you know where am I gonna put it? And it had a huge footprint, but what I and. I don't want to say I was a skeptic as much as a lot of the other people were back then, because if if I'm to give myself any credit, the one credit I had is I knew I didn't know a whole lot, but I also knew that there were these three, and we'll talk about this more, there were these th different clicks in online. It's like, here's the strength, actually, here's like the powerlifting strength click, and that's different than the strength coach strength click vastly different yes. and then that's different than the personal trainer click mm -hmm. and then that's different than the the writer click you know and i'm working as a personal trainer i'm a power lifter and i'm doing seminar for strength strength coaches and it's the weirdest fucking thing you know what i'm talking about it's like these people hate these people these people hate these people you know this the power lifters hate the strength coaches because they're not fucking strong the strength yeah. coaches think the power lifter is only strong because of drugs meanwhile and i got clients that can't squat the bar yeah and I'm like, I'm trying to figure this all out. And then I realized real quick as a power lifter, I don't know how to train a mom, you know, just gen pop. And I, I've, I've told this story before, you'll get a kick out of this. My first real client that I had that was not in a strength, a hardcore strength gym, because before that it was bodybuilding gym, stuff like that. And back then the 45 pound plates always stayed on the bar. I mean, if they were off the bar, it's like, this place sucks. You're not going to train here. And my first client, I threw just fucking threw a plate on each side and took it out. I could tell right away, like, this does not look good. So I'm like holding really, really close. And I had to pull, you know, yep. pull it off of them. And I wasn't that dick that makes them do a force wrap yeah. for a minute. And I went home and told my wife, I'm like, I don't know what I got myself into. Like this fucking guy could not bench one. It totally threw me for such a loop because my whole entire life, I mean, that's like set one. And um, so that was when I had to start attending conferences and clinics that personal trainers were doing. Then I'm listening to there and, you know, it's like Animal House, like fucker, fucker, you know, the devil and the, yeah. and I'm like, that's bullshit. And I'm like, but, but is it bullshit? But can it help my client? And the world, it was crazy at that time because the worlds are so vastly different. But getting back to the scorcher, because I'm bouncing all over the place, one leg at a time, that thing was the shit. It really was. It, my problem was being 300 pounds at the time, getting under the band was a motherfucker, but it's like, okay, I don't need to get under the band because I suck at this so bad. Just do one, put one wing up in the air, there it goes. And they and had no, handles. Did you mind have handles back then? I don't know if it had handles back then. Where were the handles? Gunnar Peterson told me to put handles on it. Where were the handles at? It was right attached to the rounded pad. Yeah, that would have helped. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you had one. <laughs> no. Yeah, Gunnar Peterson, I gave him one. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because I remember a big he, ass was like, pad. he was like, Brett, I hope he doesn't care if I say this now, but he he texted he texted me like this is J Lo's favorite exercise, and that was yeah in two thousand six or s or late two thousand six yeah, or yeah. early two thousand seven. I went, oh my god, that, that's so cool! Like because J Lo was mm -hmm. huge back then, and he's like, but this thing needs handles on it. So I'm like, it does, especially for a single leg. You're so stable. Yeah, yeah that would have helped you a lot. Oh, yeah. And it had, well, it had a wide base, so I'm yeah. all about that. Yeah. You know, sumo deadlifter squats. I think squats. that's what – I think I copied the rounded the rounded pad from the glute ham to yeah. up with a wide base because I had the, the sumo 45-degree hyper and everything, and I like the wide option too. Yeah. So Now get, now to jump back in but, where but you back, were. Back yeah. then, it would have never sold. No. You learn, you have to learn. Yeah. You have to learn as a writer. You have to learn as an entrepreneur. You have to learn as a someone selling strength training equipment, what sells. And I was a rookie with everything. Yeah. I, I had to learn a lot along the years. Yeah. And not only that, it's, it's the footprint alone was creating the issues. And I, I 
remember pieces of the conversation because a long time ago, but then it was, you're also fighting the culture that doesn't like this to begin with. So now you got two big strikes against it. Mm -hmm. Then a price point that you kind of need that culture to buy yeah, from. Yep. And, but what you were saying about content at the time is there, you know, it's, there was T Nation, there's Elite FTS. I mean, there were, there were places that had articles and I was under contract for T Nation for a long time. And they vetted, content was vet, vetted, right? And it was, I have to think back, you know, I'm trying to think of sometimes if, you know, some people slip through that maybe were posers or fake, but I'm sure they did. But for the most part, because there were editorial, you know, there, there were people vetting the content. Yep. And when things went online, I think it got a little bit better than magazines because the magazines, you didn't know if those people were actually writing it or not. Right. It could have just been the editor. Or there were writers that would write under other people's name. Right. Online, it became still, it became the author was most of the time the real author. I can't think of very many times unless it was, you know, because even TC wrote for himself, mm -hmm. you know, so he wasn't writing other people's shit. They would edit things, which to me, that was why I went. It's because I couldn't write for shit. And I remember him saying, I don't care if you can write it on a napkin and send it to me. I'm cool with that. And I'm like, oh, my God, thank you. You know, somebody can edit this crap and then put it out. And then when Facebook came, it, it became a way for us to put our articles out and have traffic and, and to pull traffic back in. And then but even then, for me, that was weird because I didn't want to put a lot of time into that because my whole goal was to get people on my site which is the embedded art the embedded youtube is where i'm going here it's like so the longest time for us all youtube was was a way to control the bandwidth on our own site so we didn't have to pay yeah. for yeah. it so it was just the embedded file yeah. to stick into yep. the wordpress or whatever you were using mm -hmm. and then send it out with given no fucks at all on youtube and i got i fell behind the curve on that because it's like I don't care. I still sometimes I even wonder, like, I really don't fucking care because the goal is to be on the site. Yep. Because that's where the products are. You know, and I remember people giving me advice back then, like, man, you have to have like a big banner on your website, sending people to the, your YouTube page. I'm like, you're fucking out of your mind, man. And may, maybe they were right to a degree, you know. But that's the hard <laughs> thing. You and I are businessmen. We care about profit. So it was always like, okay, like you have metrics, but the the one metric is what's your profit? Sales. <laughs> your sales. sales. Sales and profit. The, yeah, but, yeah. But then there's these other metrics like back when website where blogs were popular, I would I cared so much about my Alexa ranking because I, I had a higher mm -hmm. now who cares, but I had a higher okay. ranking blog than everyone. And you cared about followers and you cared about this, but it was really profit and then you start realizing that you can become too so i know i know some of the guys now who have the most followers on instagram they're so obsessed with making a reel a day they have not created the platform the platforms like like i have mm -hmm. with booty by brett it takes a while to get those established yes your 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 strength training equipment how long did that take you to perfect? Oh, God. I mean, we've been in business 25 years. And the the business model I've always run, always used, and not very and not communicated very well, is now it's easy to communicate because everybody knows who the fuck Alex Jones and InfoWars is. Or just follow me for a minute, <laughs> right? <laughs> Where um, he uses his products to pay for the content so the content can be free. Is all I've ever wanted to do was to put the content out for free, the live, learn, pass on. But people live under this misconception that content just is free to produce, which, you know, you know, and anybody who produces contents know that that's a fucking lie. You know, if you got to produce it. You, then there's your hours put into yeah. it. You got to host it. There's all these other, it costs money to create the content. And then the products would pay for the content kind of sp spooled that way. And then trying to find the balance, 
You know, like if all you do is that, and then it's not creating any profit, then you can't do that. You know, and it's, I mean, that's with some of these guys who have, you know, 4 million followers on Instagram, but they get paid through sponsorships and their revenue. They're like when, well, I think Instagram just stopped monetizing the reels and stuff, but like they're not making, they might make a million a million a year but when when they have four million followers you think they'd be making more than that you think they'd be i'm not saying a million years and a lot but i'm saying is that you think they'd be but they're too obsessed with their numbers it's really hard to come up with a reel or a tiktok a day you have to be at it every day and filming and yeah it's tough but they're obsessed with the followers and coming up with the and so they don't take the time to create the platforms them that make money you know, if if you come to my, if you stumble upon Brett Contreras, you want a book about glute training? Okay, here's Glute Lab. You want a program? Here's Booty by Brett. You want some equipment, some glute home glute train equipment? BC Strength. And it takes a long time to set those up. And I think a lot of people don't don't take the time anymore because you get caught up in the now social media is so different. But back back to circle back to what you were saying, putting the content out online. Yeah. I remember when I first started personal training, it's like I was so influenced by Louis. I read every article you wrote, every article Louis, Jim Wendler, and all the guys. I respected the guys who had gyms and trained people. So, like, even Zach Evanesh, Jason Ferrugia, those, Joe DeFranco, mm-hmm. those were my people because I owned a small garage gym and I had that equipment. I had the specialty bars, I had the chains, the bands, the. The 45 degree hyper, the glute ham developer, the reverse hyper, the sled. Um, <clears throat> so, when, so, yeah, like, I remember this website, deepsquatter.com mm-hmm. or something. I read every article. I'm like, man, why does Louis do so many good mornings? <laughs> yeah. But, um, and, you know, do they really do that? And, and but I, I followed, uh, you know, I, I was influenced by Westside very much. So, I was influenced by all you guys. To me, it was like, these guys are more successful than me. They've been doing it longer. I'm going to copy them until I know enough to tweak it. And then I started specializing training women. I thought up the hip thrust. And then over the time, I'm like, I think people are missing out on doing abduction. You know, you don't have to have the strongest glute medius to squat. But to build the upper glutes, why would we not do dynamic hip abduction for the glute medius? So I started doing more of that, more cables, more bands more machines and it's just then i come up come up with this rule of thirds like a third of your glute training should be vertical hip extension exercise squats deadlifts lunges a third should be horizontal because they're not as hard on the body and they strengthen different ranges the hor- the vertical strengthens the stretch the horizontal strengthens the lockout that's all the stuff louis was doing you know interestingly for the glutes but i just added hip thrusts and glute bridges and single leg hip thrusts and stuff like that to it and then and then finally, another third should be lateral, which was kind of a, you know, we always talked, like strength coaches, physical therapists talked about the glute medius, but they didn't make it a central part of their programming. You just thought the glute medius gets developed by doing single leg movements, but in any stabilizing role, it just fires just enough to stabilize, not maximally. So that's when I can I, I started with your, your guys' system, you know? You know, and I liked like Joe DeFranco, he'd tweak things for athletes. And then, and I mean, I'd use Westside and all those methods. And I still love bands, even with all this research now on long length training. I think we don't have enough research. It's like, I can do hack squats. You know, I, I have two different hack squats one that's slanted more, and you can only load up three or four plates per side for me, um, and one that's less mm-hmm. slanted. And I can load up five plates per side. I can do 10 reps. That's my PR on that. But if I do one set of 10 to failure on that hack squat machine, I'm sore for one set. I mean, it's going to failure on that hack squat. It's more of a breathing. You can just keep going. It's a breathing set, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm sore off one set for three, four full days. And I can't train productively again. But I can... If I put a, a trap bar underneath the platform and attach bands at the same time, I can put like the monster band and like maybe one other band. And I, it looks easy when you film it. It looks like it's not that hard, but it's brutal. 
I can do 10 reps with that. So they're bo it, 10 reps of just having those, a big band and a, a smaller band is equal to 450 in terms of effort. But they, the, ha the, the plate loaded hits the bottom for the stretch portion, whereas the bands are easier at the bottom, harder at the top. They don't produce the soreness. I can do three sets and not be as sore as one set. And people don't talk about that enough. You know, the soreness that, that all the full range training, you can add in a lot more volume using bands and chains or just exercise that strength that hit the lockout too. And we've always done that. Bodybuilders have always done that for biceps. They would include, you know, a preacher curl or an incline curl. They do a regular barbell curl, an easy bar curl, maybe a hammer curl, but they'd always throw in a concentration curl or something that where they work their shortened position for the squeeze. But now with the research, all this evidence supporting long length training, people are going, they just take it too far. They, well, act, there's, like, they act like that's all you should be doing. And now you just don't, don't do any, everything should just be long length. There's more mechanisms at work. And you know this far more than I do. And with say the example that you gave as you're saying that I'm trying to like figure out you know in my brain you know why and the first thing usually the first thing that's going to come to my mind is not going to be the first thing that's going to come to somebody else's mind because the meathead background i'm thinking pressure you know i'm like okay when you do a hack squat and you got that weight loaded all the way at the bottom you have tremendous amount of pressure at the bottom abdominal pressure blood pressure yeah. head pressure right now you reduce that a little bit now it doesn't become so much of a breathing thing mm -hmm. at the six to eight outside of the force curve that yeah. you know what i'm yeah, saying yeah. we're just talking breathing yeah, and pressure point. right right now, where you know that blood pressure plays a role in there or just over i don't know if it would be systemic pressure i don't know what it would be if you've experienced it you know what i'm talking but that about could ex that could influence like well we we call it CNS fatigue. Yes. But think about all the exercises that beat the crap out of you. There's a couple studies indicating that it's not really CNS fatigue, it's muscle damage. But anyone who lifts heavy knows you go and do deadlifts, all the lifts that require that abdominal, intra-abdominal mm -hmm. pressure and the whole, you know, you just know it. When it's so hard at the bottom, you're like, you know, that, that stuff I think is what takes it out of you so much. You got to limit it. Mm -hmm. You got to limit it to a couple of days a week or just limit the volume. You can't get all your volume from that. Well, I, I want to take that and go back to your, your rule of thirds, because I just listened to a video, you talking about this and it stretches the concept stretches to all body parts. As far as I'm concerned is when you're talking about the rule of thirds and breaking it into those three things, the, the topic of volume is going to come up and then workload. I like to distinguish how I define these first off. To me, volume is just sets times reps, where workload is sets times reps times weight, because mm -hmm. they are two yep. different, and they get convoluted, especially between bodybuilding and powerlifting, and intensity is another one. Like It means one thing in the strength and conditioning world and something else in the bodybuilding world, where when you're dealing with certain the, the glute movements that you're talking about, some of them the workload, I assume, is going to have to be heavier. The weights needs to be heavier, and the reps are probably going to be a little bit lower, where other ones is going to be more mind-muscle type contraction type thing. Usually those movements aren't, I don't think they're created equal, and they're usually not the same. Right. So how would you take the rule of thirds for the glutes and then expand with that a little bit? Well, okay, so let's think of pecs. Well, maybe a, a third of your volume should be things that stretch the pecs deep, you know, like compound movements. But then another third should be ones that s focus on the squeeze, you know, cable crossovers, pec deck. Um, they're not going to get, well, pec deck can get you sore if you haven't done it in a while. But like, mm -hmm. if you do them all the time, it doesn't get you as sore as the things that stretch you a lot. And then a third would be more isolation, like, like you're just... Well, kind of like mind the angles, you know what I mean? Like, don't just do everything flat, do things. You got an incline, flat and decline vector, and you can do isolation and compound movements from that. But that's kind of how I take of it. Like, even with delts, like sometimes use dumbbells and they hit you at the top, but everyone thinks 
because theoretically, you take a dumbbell, there's no torque at the bottom, zero. The dumbbell's right under the shoulder joint. There's no moment arm. Then you raise it all the way out to the side and that's where the moment arm is maximized. So people will say this only trains you in the short length. But when you're doing lateral raises, you come to the top, when you've got a 40 or 50 pound dumbbell and you've got a long arm like me, now you're coming down, that's a huge, you're trying to slow it down. You feel it all the way until it comes down to the bottom when you reverse it. I do think you're getting tension in the stretch on the way down, trying to control the momentum. Um, so I disagree that it's like all or nothing. And then so people will say like dumbbells are just a shortened movement for the delts. Mm -hmm. Whereas like dumbbell side raises, dumbbell laterals, whereas using a cable column is more the stretch. But the way people do cables for delt raises, they'll have it at, at an angle. If you really want all the tension and stretch, then you would need the cable column set up at the height of your hand, perpendicular, so horizontal, so it's all in stretch. But then as you come up, the light of the cable would come up and you'd have zero tension in the shortened position. So what people typically do is they have it a little lower and it's, if you mapped it out, it's not all or nothing. But the point is with delts, do your compound exercises. You know, those are gonna be your meat and potatoes for delts. Do, do some type of pressing mo movements. Then you have your, sing, your, your delt raises, front, side, and rear. But just do use dumbbells and use cables or like and machines. Because sometimes if all you do is dumbbells, man, and you're trying progressive overload, you, you get to a point where you're like, I'm not going to try and do 50 pounds for <laughs> to beat 10 yeah. reps. Um, or, or uh, you know, so, so then switch to cables for a while. Or one day a week do dumbbells, one day cables, or just use machines. Or like, you know, if you have a partner, you can use the shoulder, the lateral raise machines. Have your partner push down on the eccentric to get an enhanced eccentric there. But just the variety is good. <clears throat> People get too caught up in, you know, in in this is best but they think of which exercise is best but think about what's the best program it makes me think about everyone can make a better burger than mcdonald's but no one can make a better business it's like okay cool what, whatever exercise you think is best for glutes whether it's squats or hip thrusts or whatever but what about the whole system so oh, these yeah. guys who bash hip thrusts and i'm like all right what's your show me your program the guys who bash exercises in general. Okay, show me your show. You, you've never shown me a workout because mm -hmm. I've written so many damn programs in my life. I can glance at some and go, that's not optimal. So you're bashing hip thrusts. So what's your glute training program? You have them do squats, RDLs, and lunges twice a week, three times a week. That's probably overkill. You can't do heavy walking lunges and squats and RDLs three times a week. But my my clients can train three times a week because we're doing a lot. Like West Side, mm -hmm. you guys would do reverse hypers a lot. You guys would do, you know, glutes a lot, supplementary because you're not you're doing your heavy work with the with the with the squats and deadlifts. But even then, you're using a lot of bands and chain tension. But my point is, show me a better system because you can bash this exercise, but it it adds volume. It adds it 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 provides you know like the abduction work hits the glute medius. And, you know, you have different subdivisions of the muscles. So it, I just think people don't think of the total program. Like there's all these people bashing exercise in the last two years. You've seen them. They bash the pullover, the straight arm oh, yeah. pull down, the don't do this. This exercise is stupid. But when I do straight arm pull downs, a lot of times that's the best pump I get in my lats. So it's like it has to do something. <laughs> you can. Yeah. I've read the studies. I read the studies when they came out with the EMG. But. That's why I like considering everything. You don't just go by one thing. You go by functional anatomy. You go by, yeah, you consider EMG because we don't have training studies on everything. So you do you get a pump from it? Are you sore the next day? Where are you sore? You should consider all these things. And it, it's kind of, I don't like the way that social media has gone where you get rewarded for these bold statements because you and I could make the boldest statements oh, yeah. of all. We, if we wanted to, or who, yeah. who do you think would be better at pseudoscience? 
He's jokers or an actual scientist. If I wanted to, oh, an actual scientist, yeah. if they can build the confidence to pull it off. Well, no, if they right. turn to the dark side. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah I mean right, that, right? right? I mean, but the 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 tonality and how right. they pitch it yeah. is, is a huge part. I know. And the, but I see what they do, and I go, I could do, I could, I could make a post. Who do you think could bash the hip thrust more than anyone? Well, Me. You should be right. able to, right? Yeah. Who do you think could praise the hip thrust better than anyone? Yes. Me. Who do you think could bash the squat? I mean, think about coming out with a, 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 here's why the squat will always be king of all exercises. And you make a post on that. And, you know, you can talk about Tom Platts. You can talk about mm -hmm. all these things. And then, but then you could also make a post saying, here's why the squat is the single most overrated movement of all time. Oh, yeah. And, you know, why would you you know if you're trying to build your quads why wouldn't you be supported be you know be in a leg press being up the pendulum squat a hack squat something where you're supported where they quads actually give up first and it's not a balancing issue or something see what i'm saying you can just yeah. make up whatever you want and then it gets tons of likes because well sometimes i wonder if <clears throat> if they know enough to, two things if they know enough to do that and if they've, I don't want to throw age into it, but if they're old enough and have the wisdom enough to know to do that, because I, I have biases, you have biases. You know, I can lay my biases out right now, but I can also debate, I can also debate against myself better than almost Same, anybody yeah, else can yeah. debate against me on my own biases. Yeah. Now, you might be able to point out other things I don't know. And I'm like, cool, that's even more shit to debate against my own bias. But if you're to, if you're to make, at least in the world that I came up in, if you were to make a bold, which I tried to never do, a bold assumption, like this is the only way, right? <clears throat> then you were going to get pushback from that, right? And it's, so I always try to avoid that because if the pushback came from you or if it came from somebody else that's on the science side, I'm fucked. So I'm not going to do, I got I, I have to be able to fall back on, look, man, I'm just a fucking meathead, been lifting weights for 40 fucking years doing yeah. this, this, and this, you know, tell me what you're thinking. But, and then, but what you talk about is so critical. There were consequences back then. Yes. We had a, if you, you know, like think of Joel Seedman with his 90 degrees, that f 15 years ago, mm -mm. you would have Googled him and everything that came up would have been like, this this guy's not to be taken seriously. Or say you copied from people, yeah, you would get exposed. Yes. You'd Google the person's name, and the first things that would come up would be, you know, YouTube videos and articles and Reddit and things exposing them as this person's a fraud. So you wouldn't do it. We had a checks and balances system. We had a police even on Facebook. We all cared about what each other thought, and it's shifted so far from that. Now you should. If you just want money, you should. Okay, I'm going to keep thinking of an example. I do a year of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, just enough to know, you know, and then I start calling myself a black belt. What if people question where I got my black belt? I don't have to tell anyone. I can just delete their comment. And so, uh, but what I do is I go to all the top 10 Jiu Jitsu people and I watch their moves. And I just copy what they say verbatim, I, like just do it in my own, you know, here I'm, I'm here to teach you guys this. And then you just copy their material, but they're actually training jujitsu and they're, um, <clears throat> they're teaching it. They have jujitsu academies and they're, they, you don't have to do that. You have all day long to make reels. You do not have to be a practitioner anymore. In fact, it, it, it works against you because every hour you spend working with someone, could be an hour you spent on social media and to rise up in social media if you have it to where you spend 10 hours a day making reels and editing and working on that that's how you get popular these days you have to have the time and put in the manpower and being an actual practitioner works against you because whatever they put out you can just copy them there's no consequence and if if i copied you and you and you exposed if you said hey this <laughs> This Brett Contreras guy, I used to like him, but he's turned into a, a copycat. Here he is stealing a few a few of my things. I don't even have, I could just come on and be like, oh my God, talk about um, scarcity mentality. <laughs> Dave Tate thinks he owns a copyright on 
box squats. You learned it from Louie, Dave, yeah. and I'm just passing on. I didn't know you wanted credit for every, it would make you look so bad. Yeah. So you don't say anything, no one says anything. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. There's no checks and balances system anymore. There's no, and scientists like myself, Brad Schoenfeld, Alan Aragon, we, our wings are clipped because what do you think gets more likes, views, and well, the, with these entertainment algorithms, what's more entertaining? You know, carbs are the carbs are the single cause of the obesity epidemic or someone being more rational about it. Or, you know, hip thrusts are the worst exercise in existence versus here's why you should hip thrust. Like polarizing topics are way more entertaining. Pseudoscience is more entertaining than regular science. Fake news is more entertaining than real news. It's it's become a problem. I like to look at these things more through a macro lens than a micro lens, because that could be the same as I can sit here and say, fall off my diet, right? And not, I'm not on a diet, but go back to eating like a fucking slob, like I used to always do, and get really bloated in the next two weeks and say I weigh 30 pounds more. Uh -huh. I'm not 30 pounds fatter. That's completely different than if I gain 30 pounds over 10 yeah. years, right? So. The way that you're explaining it is kind of like, here's this micro, this micro view. Instead of looking at a decade of work, we're going to look at a year of work where the people that you're talking about a year from now may not even be here. So they may get millions of views, but what are the total number of views that they have over a decade, right? The person that's going to have the smaller amount of views say three or four thousand over the period of the decade if they last the whole decade we'll have more views and they'll have more followers and ultimately more customers of whatever they're trying to sell right because what matters isn't the followers what matters are the people that will convert from a business side if all you're looking at is notoriety and fame well you're going to be a flash in the pan anyhow you see what I'm saying? So, <clears throat> yeah, think about 10 people from 10, 15, who's still very popular from 10 years ago? The incredible ones. Think about it. I mean, the ones that are still around, right, are the ones that have figured out, as yourself, how to communicate with all the voices, you know, in the different s spheres, and <clears throat> have not lived on blunt, bold statements that are all bullshit, have been willing to say, Maybe I was wrong on that, or actually not maybe, I was wrong yeah. on that. My delivery was not right, right? And it's, maybe it's a little bit easier for, for me coming up because the internet, as far as content, was kind of like a new thing. Yeah. You know, so I'm writing articles and I'm putting stuff out there, trying to use a voice of somebody that's never written before, trying to take cues that, I'm, that I've always learned in the gym. Arch, 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 yeah. arch, and then write that in words and then find out 10 years later. That's not really what I meant. <laughs> what I meant was a tight, neutral spine, but that's what you I tell. I still use all those cues. Yeah, I know, but you see what I'm saying, though. Remember, you, yeah, yeah. yeah, knees out, like... And then those came, those got cr cr <laughs> well, they get crushed, right? And so for me though, it's I'd look at but it. It works. I, yeah. So if it was, if I'm telling a two hundred chest up, knees out, yes, sit back. I know all the yeah. So if I'm telling a two hundred and seventy five pound power lifter, chest up, arch. He's you know? not going to hyperextend. He's just no. going to get to neutral, right? But now if that if I'm doing a seminar, yeah. And I got somebody that's six five, 160 pounds. <laughs> then they do that. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Well, I'm doing what you wrote. Yeah. I'm like, oh shit. My delivery, you see, you see yeah. that that guy that I was helping can't do that because he's got two liters for erectors. Yep. You know, so <laughs> it, 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 he's got a tight back. Yeah. And where so it's I guess there's some inherent built in excuses to where it's like, look, we didn't figure out how this could effectively be communicated, but it does still kind of piss me off, though, because if I make a video and I'm showing somebody I'm, I'm trying to work with somebody squat to clean their technique up to squat more weight, I got to fucking say in the video, look, I may give cues that may be wrong, but it's going to get this person to do what I want them to do. You know, so, well, I, you know, and that, that I read something on a, I read a comment on some page and it was so, it hit home. It was like for the first time in, you know, history, 
little children are at the same table as adults and like people with zero experience are at the same table with the top scientists in the comments section and you have there's no way of filtering them out it's like mm -hmm. it's like this you, you have 40 years of experience as a trainer and you make a comment and you have someone who literally just formed a, a, a an account with a fake name who lives in his parents basement attacking yeah. you for it and it's just something that we didn't use to we used to have respect it's not there anymore the the world's changing a little bit so you have to some of the criticisms are good but so much so much yeah. of it is just hate and like bashing bashing of people and i think it drives a lot of legit especially scientific people they're like why the hell would i waste my time on this platform this is disrespectful it, it, it's not it a good does. use of my time it does but it's <clears throat> my advice to them would be it shouldn't because the children won't be at the table in a couple of years they don't have the attention span for one thing the ones that do have the attention span aren't going to be saying the same things at the table in a couple of years right right so you know but it is but we grew up at a different time. I mean, you, where you grew up at a time where your criticism you were getting was profound and it was across different message boards and people would send you, you the link. You'd be like, motherfucker, what are you going to do with this? And I'm getting bashed for West Side left and right all over the place. So I'm calloused, you know, so if yeah, I yeah. see a negative YouTube comment, I'm like, it means I like it. Like, thank you. It's engagement. Fucking say more. <laughs> You know, the more you, meant, you can say, the, the better it is. But the one thing that I've seen that, as I think more on this as you're talking, what used to happen is if if the criticism, because it would kind of peak, like it would start, yeah. and then it, then it would almost get to a point where it's like, okay, this is too far. And then right about then, other people would come in. No, it's so true. And say, well, dude, that's fucked or, up. Or like your followers all see it and they're praising you and then they start sharing it. Now people who don't follow you look at it, they see it on their someone's yeah. story and they're like, I'm going to click on that. They don't know you. Then you, you're, you're like, oh, people are loving this. And then all of a sudden you're getting attacked left and right. And then you get attacked too much and then yeah. people come into your defense when you have a really popular post like that it does follow a wave of it's a predictable pattern yeah. it's really interesting and it's it's but i guess the my main point is if people look at it over a decade right because the reason i got into this industry is a there was nothing else i wanted to do i love this stuff I mean, I actually just loved this shit. And B, yep. I didn't know if I could be good at anything else. So they kind of corresponded with each other, where it wasn't about what can I can what could I do to make millions of dollars. It's like, what can I do so I can just train all the time and just be around this all my life? I don't care if I don't make all the money in the world. I just want to be around yeah. this until I die. You know, so it was always a longevity game. Like, how can I do that? How can I make that play? Now, some people get in the industry just for money, right? And it's probably a shitty industry to do that with, to be honest. There's other places you can make better money, you know, faster, real estate investment. There's other, yeah, there's yeah. other places, right. insurance. There's, there's other places to go if that's the main goal. I would highly suggest they do that, <laughs> you know, and the ones that are coming in, because we've seen them for 30 years the ones that come in and try to do that i can say never never do it it's 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 in the point zero 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 one percent you know it's so funny did you ever have the job where you worked in a cubicle when you were like 16 or anything uh no it was always like warehousing type stuff Ugh, well like i remember i had a, a i worked for a i did cold calls like calling people up who, ugh. I did, you know, I worked for a Bally's where I had to do sales and I was doing that. And that yeah. was terrible. Ugh. And so to, to, for, for you to get to come to here every day, like, yeah. look at this. Yeah. We, we made it. Like, I have my gym now and my day involves going there for, but I can choose my own hours. I can choose my clients. If I don't like someone, I don't need to train them. If I don't, it's such a good life and it stems from the passion but that's something I, I sometimes have to remind myself, like, you have such a good life. <laughs> yeah. Well, you always had to pivot, though, too, because it's 
when we go back, it was blogging, it was articles. I mean, that's what the driver was, you know, it was that. And then all of a sudden, Facebook kind of killed that. I mean, it, it helped it because it would pull traffic into it. But as a publisher, what that became was now my authors could just post on their own Facebook page. Yep. Why do they need to post on and send yep. me an article? They yep. can just do it there yep. and have the engagement. And it's closer to their home, yep. you know, so it's, it's so that and it probably hurt T Nation and probably hurt other publishers, too, because why come to our site? You know, then Instagram killed my training logs. Like, why come to the training log if you can just go to the Instagram? Yeah. Um, the coaching logs, you know, kind of got evaporated because of when microblogging was a thing yep. on Instagram, too. So we had to pivot from the blogs and articles still are popular. I mean, they still drive traffic, so it's not huge like the other stuff, but they still it still matters. And on to Facebook, then it was like, okay, this, this isn't what it's supposed to do. It's, uh, the metrics are not showing, so got to move somewhere else. So it's whatever that next move is, after a while, I, I don't like to, I mean, I'm fucking old, I'm 55, and I, I'm kind of sick of it, you know, but after a while, you got to figure out, like, where's the next one? And when there's yeah. fucking 70 you got to look at, mm -hmm. you can't do all of them. I don't care what Gary V says. You can't do them all. Yeah. So it's like, fuck, you know, where's it going to be? But you know what? You know it's going to be somewhere you know else. Gonna, yeah, you know it's coming. Because you already had to do it. Right. You know, a couple of times That's what before. I'm so mad at. I told you how I was like one of the early adopters of Instagram and it made my mm -hmm. and TikTok comes around. And I'm like, eh, I don't know about this. Why didn't I jump on TikTok? And then I, by the time I went to TikTok, I feel like I, I lost that weight. I was, I, I lost the ability to get it on the ground floor. Plus I don't like the platform that much, yeah. but, um, but you know, something it becomes else different though, the longer you're around though, because now, you know, before for for me, before the metrics were the the most important metrics were different than they are now. Like the most important metrics, you know, when I was starting, is just traffic overall, like Alexa, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. What is the overall traffic? Now it's traffic, but also demographic, because there's a certain demo. I don't want to say there's a certain demographic that's too young, because I did fuck that up. I mean, there was a there was a long time where and i still feel this way the content that i'd always put out is for people that put training as one of their top four priorities if it falls under that you got men's health you got a lot of other yeah. places to go that's not what i do that's not what it is and it, it limits your scope a lot right because it's a giant mass that's there that's the fitness industry yep. which i tried to stay as far away from as i could and stay in this niche industry because of the, there's more bullshit i thought associated with that but where i screwed up is i put all my focus in the demographic that would be the customer but forgot that the younger demographic will become the next customer right but i also realized that there's always a demographic still isn't in that transition yet i'm not going to spend my time there and for a while, to me, that's how I saw TikTok. Like this demographic is, it's too, it's its not old enough, just biologically yeah. not old enough to be in this conversion phase right. yet. Now that may have changed. And now the problem is you don't know what's real and what's not no. when you look at the demographics. Yep. Before we kind of knew. Now it's like, oh, the 55 year olds are all over TikTok. And I'm like, I don't fucking think so. I dude. know, are they? <laughs> I don't. That's where my frustration is. Is I don't know if I can trust the analytics, and I saw that get really fucked up with Meta over the past few years as well. It's like, you know, you're trying to trust these analytics for ad spends and stuff like this, and then, long story short, my the lead FTS Facebook page just gets whacked. It gets hacked, right? So try to get customer support by Facebook sometime. So like it's, it's it's ridiculous, and I'm spending money. I'm buying ads, yeah. right? And so I still don't have it back, right? So no. it's like a, over a year. So I went all the way through a whole holiday season. Sales didn't drop. I mean, now wait a minute. I'm spending thousands on ads every month, and I didn't see a drop in sales. I don't have a Facebook presence. So what the hell was the? What were the metrics that I'm seeing 
that's showing that I have this positive ROI when my real metrics. So that's okay. <laughs> that, that brings up a whole other topic. Like with these platforms, especially Meta, like how, how would you know if they're just lying? You can't subpoena this information. How would you ever know if they're just, you know, if they, it really does go out to the amount of people they say it does, or if it gets, because I've had, I've seen my own BC Strength ads. 10 times each you're not supposed to go out to the same person over and over and over and over and over and over mm -hmm. um you would never know how, and that's it's funny i i have a a lawyer that i hired and i'm forming a non-profit organization i'm in the middle of doing it and i'm like why why do i have to do this but no one no one's doing it it's and i'm gonna call it something like um like fairness Fair, like fairness um, fair platforms initiative or something like this where we have to have some regula regulatory body because every industry has one except social media um, they could shadow ban you without giving you a right to appeal like they say they don't shadow ban but you can see it I have got clients you type in their name nothing comes up they're shadow banned and like one of them's Persian she probably posted something like in support of like, you know, during these hard times mm -hmm. where people are being killed for speaking out and somehow it registers on their page that it's, they get, it gets flagged. But if they had workers that you could appeal it to, they would quickly realize, no, this person didn't do anything wrong, but you can't, like you just said, there's no customer service. Yeah. And they, they're, you know, I haven't gone up in followers really in two years. I was killing it. And so you could say, well, Brett, you just, you're old, you lost your touch. But I see people make similar, they take my yeah. work. If you're some 22 year old, really good looking dude that just copies my work, that might get 20 million views. <laughs> the glute training popularity has never been higher than it is right. now. So and I would I, say- And I invented would, the whole niche. Yeah. I created the niche and it took yeah. me it took me a, over a decade to make that niche legitimate. And then now it's very frustrating because it's like, you know, it rattles your confidence. It, it, it affects your business. It's like, why am I not? And, and it, it also decreases your motivation to post. It's like when I was killing it every day, I'm posting every day, but I have clients. My one client, um, you know, Eurishna, she's a, a, a wellness competitor. Um, <clears throat> Uh, she goes up a hundred thousand followers a month. Everything she does is gold. She looks amazing. I realize I, I'm not an ugly guy, but yeah. I'm not yeah. a Greek God. It just kind of sucks because it used to be when it was, when it was just, uh, when the, before the algorithms, it was just chronological order. I miss those days because scientists could squash pseudoscience easier um, now we have more misinformation, more, and it's harming, it's harming, um, for the first time, people are scoring lower on, you know, on intelligence tests for the first time ever. We're actually scoring lower because people are just glued to their phones, getting fake news and losing their critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. we're, for the, we're having young, the young population is getting shown, it's like an addiction, you know, well, I could look at my Explorer page and Half the time, it's like all these bo these bodies, these amazing bodies. Like, am I click? I'm clearly it's catering to me, but all these amazing physiques, men and women. It's like it can it can mess with your self esteem a little bit. It can give you body dysmorphia. And these younger, you know, the teenage populations are more depressed than they've ever been, and it's creating problems that way. It's cre it's creating harm for businesses when you don't. You could be doing everything right, but there, there could just be people up there who say, I like this guy, I'm going to push a button and they're on the fast track to success. Or I don't like this guy and I'm not going to, they're not going to get, they're not going to grow no matter what they do. Th what if that existed? How would we know? So it sucks because how would you provide evidence of this? They don't have to, they don't have to publish their algorithms. They don't have to do anything. They could be, they could be um, discriminating in some fashion against age against race against religion against some somehow you'd never know it 
um, and and at the scary level, they can influence elections and oh, things yeah. like that. And so, to me, it's just a no brainer. We don't you don't want to ever wait till till it's too late. If history tells us one thing, when you have too much power, it gets abused. And so, I would love to just see some sort of regulatory body making keeping them honest. It's like first of all, what you described, how you can't get a hold of customer service. You guys make billions and billions of dollars profit. Oh yeah. Hire some customer service people. You you don't get to have your account hacked and then you can't get a hold of someone for a year. That's that's such yes. poor customer service. Or, or give me a competitor that I can go to. Right? So it's yeah. I mean that's that's kind of what's lacking there and that's <clears throat> I see. I, I, there's there's two ways that I look at this. Is the rabbit hole way, which just gets me mad and pissed off because I'm older. Then these other, there's the other way. Like I can't do shit about any of this. Now, if you do something like that, then yeah, I can help do something there. But since I can't do shit about this, I still have to find a way to acquire customers, mm -hmm. right? So I can only be upset about this for like five minutes yeah. because I still got this other shit. Yeah, I got to find this other path. You I know, think to pull that's people my in. problem though. It's like that serenity prayer. I'm not a really yeah this guy but it's like i'm gonna butcher it but no i get it god grant me the uh serenity to ex accept the things i cannot change uh the courage to change the things i can and the wisdom to know the difference i have changed the industry yes i have made change so i know what i'm capable of if i put my mind mm -hmm. no one has more passion and energy than i do <laughs> but it takes time away from is it worth your time is it worth your effort yes. So I'm going to start this nonprofit organization to try to arouse support. And I, I just wish people had common sense. Like, why are we, you know, you should have publish your algorithms or I wish we could just go back to chronological order. That That's fair for everyone. We then they have problems, well. though, where people were just spamming the fuck out of it, though. You know, they make 30 posts in one hour just so your post ends up being in there. Well, we, that's that's solvable. Yeah, yeah. You know, I sit there and I look at all the things that we do. When you make a post and there's 10 spam comments that you no, got to yeah, delete. It's, it's like, like our emails now. How can you not police that? I don't know. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, yeah, yeah, I, just think, I just think <laughs> I just I think of everything how uh, I don't know. You, I would I would just think that someone else would have fought this battle. Politicians, why why aren't they fighting the battle? Because they could lose elections on on account of these things. So I think they'd be in support of it, but I think a lot of them are just clueless about social media in general. But it is a whole different world now. And like you, I don't gain, get the followers that I used to, but my business is still doing well. Mm -hmm. I haven't had seen a drop in business, even though I don't. the last couple of years I haven't gotten a lot of new followers, but my business is still doing well. So Well, that's, that's the main metric, right? Yes. Because it's, if... If you're looking to make an impact, and this this is one of the realizations I had to come through over a period of time, if you're if you're willing to like make an impact and to help change people's lives, who are you going to be able to change the most? The people that don't support you or the people that do, right? Right. Exactly. Well, obviously the people that do. Yep. You know, so those are going to be the people that are going to, you know, be a part of your member site. You know the body or booty by bread yep. or whatever. Those are those people. You know, those are the ones that garnered the most attention and the most support and then those people are going to refer other people mm -hmm. right and then that's it's, it's it's personal training 101 right if you just go back to where your most of your clients come from and but i think our our egos are so easily fed you know by something that can go viral and not bring you any customers or but what it's so funny you said because before they remember when you used to post about your book and there'd be all your fans were raving about it now they sense up oh, this is a he's promoting his book he's promoting his new product it gets 300 likes you know it's yeah no no half of right. them being your family or something mm -hmm. like your mom if like, they hey. see it right that, right they, that's, the, that's the point it's like it. they squash that right away they know yeah. you're go try and promote a seminar on instagram it it just falls dead yeah you know, it, 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 it so but back back then you could before these crazy algorithm changes it was so much fun because people would talk about ads i never had to make an ad i was gaining 1200 followers a day 50,000 people were watching my story every day and i'd have 
I'd post 50 stories. I'd repost everyone who tagged me, not everyone, but like all my clients. And it was fun for everyone. We were all doing well. They were doing well and we were doing well. But one thing you can count on is the platforms will find a way to take more of the money in, into their hands and keep it away from your hands. That's why I miss about chronological order. Everyone does. I wish we could show. I wish there was a way to show that numerically. Like mm -hmm. back then, they made X amount and the businesses made Y amount. But now it's way more skewed, in my opinion. And you could have a high follower count, but that doesn't mean you're making a lot of money because like i said anytime you promote your products those don't do well when when you annually review your your business in general do you run scenarios through your head like what if i lost this channel entirely so it's uh, i call it like crisis strategy yeah you know so crisis intervention um i was going to say because you should you know, because it's, I got to do that. Like, what if I lose my main manufacturer? Yeah. Like, what is my plan? Right. Right. Because you don't want to be in that situation to where you get hit. Because normally when something like that happens, it, you know, COVID was an example of that for a lot of people. It's usually not just one thing you get hit with. It's usually one thing you're like, fuck, this really sucks, but I can manage this. Then two more come. You know, it's, it's usually never that one. But that's that back strategy for, and I'm saying this mostly for people who are listening that have a business because if all your eggs are in that one basket and you haven't thought through like what happens if this basket is just gone, you're deleted, right? It's in, I, mean, I could definitely see you being shadow banned just because it's the fucking glute guy. Yeah. You know, and that whole thing changed what a couple years ago or whatever it was. So mm -hmm. then what's that strategy? Well, you, you were ahead of it. You got the booty by Brett that's already there. But it's funny what you're talking about as a business strategy. I always thought about that just over the last few years. I, I started when you're going up 1,200 followers a day like I was and on top of the world, you can do no wrong. You It, it feeds your ego. And, and I've always been, if you know my reputation, like I've always been the guy who stays at conferences and talks to everyone. And I try to be you know, like the people's champ. Like I, mm -hmm. I, 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 but I, I found myself starting to get, say things that I didn't used to say. And I was like, man, if Instagram went down, I'm back to being, it, 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 it humbles you. I was like, yeah, I need to stop. You know, I need to go back to my roots and just be the best personal trainer. I can be good to my, the people around me, and do right by them and focus on that because you start, it can change you when you're, you become a high level influencer. You're, you want to collaborate with the big dogs. You want to be this and you stop being good to the people around you. And I'm, so there's some good that came out of my slowdown of growth and everything. It humbles you and gets you back to your roots. Like I'd say that's more than some good. That's a lot of good. Right, because at the end of the day, when you set the phone down, you're still there. I know. Right? <laughs> With the people who care. Right. The people around you care way more about you than the people that are online. They don't give a fuck no. about you. Right. You know? But people get mm -hmm. lost. You look at some of these people, you know, all the people passing away because they're taking too much steroids mm -hmm. or um, what was that? Greg... Plit or whatever the guy who got the, the train yeah right yeah yeah like, yeah i can't remember his name but he had everything in the world going for him and it's like when you take a step of why you just died <laughs> it's really sad mm -hmm. so you, it, it causes you to think more deeply about life and what you want to be known for what you want to be remembered by and this is interesting to me though because this just made me realize that you have to live two worlds here because your clients are also ones that you know that are in the fitness bikini they're in an industry where they're, they're having followers is almost vital to the success of their profession so you have to and, and, yeah. wow this is fucked up right so on one hand you have to be like frustrated but then not be frustrated to them so they don't get frustrated well it's funny because um <laughs> the other day i was talking to a client and she's like you're so awesome you're like uh 
you know, you're like my my videographer too. So you know those memes that you've seen, like what people think I do versus what I really mm -hmm. do. You think I'd be there, like we said earlier, like all right, come on, chest up, knees out, like <laughs> three more, come on. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times, I'm filming and I have to learn my clients angles that they they have one butt cheek that's bigger than the other <laughs> they want this they they prefer for me to tap on the on the video and slide down to to to, to decrease the exposure they like it a little bit darker they like moving shots that are a little close one likes just a standstill shot that's far away but i learn these things because hell i want them coming to me and the more value you can provide but it's not just about being the tr so so now if you train at Glute Lab Fort Lauderdale, I don't even have a sign up outside. I have, it's just, there's no sign. I don't want it to be packed. I just want it to be 10 people that come and it's pretty exclusive. Like you don't have to worry about waiting on equipment. You're gonna be able to film your stuff. And I'm, <clears throat> you know, I have a refrigerator and food there and I'm like, just take, <laughs> Yeah. Take, take, if you're thirsty, take something. Don't worry, I'll keep it stocked. And it's, I'm, I'm not just training them, I'm filming them. And I try to learn, I'll ask them, did I do a good job there? And the, <laughs> it's, it's so funny. They're like, no, not really. I like this, <laughs> you know, and so I try to learn. But the more value I can pro provide to them because I want to be training high level people and, the, you you want to ser serve as their cameraman too and their and you need to see the value of it because you know what would you have done if back in the day you were like louis can you film this like he would have oh, no. thrown your phone out but it's a different world now yeah. these people make their money by filming their workouts and so i've had mm -hmm. to go through the era where i'm like no phones your phones go down this is serious training well if i say that i'm not going to have any high level yeah. the high level female the bikini they all they have to do is post their workouts and they crush it how nice would that be yeah yeah how nice would that I be know, if yeah, all yeah, you have yeah, to yeah. do is film your workouts and post them and people went crazy it's not like that yeah. for you and i and we're dinosaurs but oh well, no no they don't want to see the shit that i'm doing no, they don't want to do, me neither no they don't want to see that at all <laughs> now your journey you started you were where were you born was it arizona phoenix yeah. phoenix so what took you to san diego my grandparents both lived in San Diego and we'd go there every year to visit and my whole family always wanted to live there. So I remember I was like, <clears throat> I think I just turned 40 and I paid off my house in Phoenix for the first time. It was a goal of mine to pay off a house before I was 40. Back then the houses were only a few hundred grand. That was nice. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but um, I remember telling my girlfriend at the time, I said, oh my God, I'm making, I was making like 440 grand a year. And I'm like, I think I can afford a, pl a place in San Diego. I think I can get a place by the beach, like right by the beach, you know? And I did. And I thought I had made it back then. To me, I had, I, I had the life. And I was gonna, I was like, don't open a gym. Actually learn how to relax, go to the beach every day, read a book. And that lasted three months. Cause I was going around trying to find a gym and I'm at like, you know, the EOS and the, the all these, you know, the, every gym was, had some huge flavor. They didn't have nice equipment. It was too packed. And I also realized from my own branding, I like showing my workouts and I don't want someone in the background doing mm -hmm. the worst form ever or just, I'm like, okay, I need my own gym. I just have to have it. So I built a glute lab. And then, like I said, I, I started training my client Masa. She... Was, everyone loved her. She was the, probably the best bikini competitor in San Diego. And so when she started training with me, everyone wanted to. And so my income doubled and then tripled. It doubled the next year, then it tripled the next year. And now I'm like, I, I, I was a high school math teacher for six years. I, I'm making 30 grand a year. I'm making so much money, I don't know what to do with it. I still dress, mm -hmm. I wear these jorts. I have a Toyota Tacoma that I've driven for 10 straight years. I don't care about cars. I I'm laughing because I, I did just, just like fucking three hours ago, watch the video where you showed that yeah. thing and the seats all fucked up in <laughs> yeah, the back yeah, or yeah. something. They, they hate it. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, what? What? I don't want to start living the good life. I'm going to help my family out. So I paid off the one house by the beach and gave it to my sister. Still pay the property taxes. She's in heaven. 
Then I bought another house, paid it off, gave it to my mom. And then I paid off. I said, Dad, how much, how much do you owe on the mortgage? He lives on the beach in San Diego. And he moved after I did, but I paid off his mortgage. Then I paid off my Vegas house. That's going to my twin brother if I, if I were to die. But I, I bought houses for my whole family before I ever paid off my own house, before I ever did anything nice for myself. And I've always spoiled my clients along the way. I stopped charging clients eight years ago. I haven't charged. If you train with me, you don't pay. And I, I'll tell you, I'm your coach. I'm here to help. Text me. FaceTime me. Like, I'm single. I'm not married yet. I don't have kids. So I have a lot of time to devote and I want to help you maximally. So I've always tried to give back. But the more I gave back, the more it helped me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the more I focused on my clients, they're posting about me saying, oh my God, I love my coach. It just gives me social proof. But then during COVID, we all start hanging out together. And it's kind of funny because I was so bored during that first few days during the COVID quarantine. I'm like, oh my God, I'm such a social person. So California was crazy. They had we were under lockdown for like nine months, like gyms. Mm -hmm. And so I started hanging out with all of them. They all started coming to my gym. They they had nothing else to do. So instead of coming three days a week, now they're coming six days a week, staying for three hours because it's the only time they can get out of their house. So now that's when I came up with strong lifting. I love powerlifting. I love squats, bench, and deadlifts, but I also love hip thrust, military press, and weighted chin-ups. So I said, I'm going to do a sport with six lifts, not three. And I started having my girls. It's always just been a sport for my clients. Yeah. I really think it could be compiled because I think it's better for your physique. And if you think training hard for three, training for three lifts is hard, try training for six lifts. Nice. It is tough. Yeah. yeah. It, it's like training for the, because the squat and deadlift compete with each other. If you just squatted, you could get stronger at the squat. If you just deadlifted. Well, the overhead so, is going to compete with the bench to a certain degree yeah, too, right? the overhead and the bench. And, yeah. then, and then you got hip thrusts in there now. So it's funny because I, we, we would mostly, I can talk about the training for that, but the, the social life I created. So we, we went to Miami and we had a, a competition. Then we went to Tulum and Cancun for a week. And we had the greatest time of our lives. And that's what... The money has been nice because I can spoil people. Just like when I was a high school math teacher making 30 grand a year, my friend Rob and Scotty, they were making, you know, two, 300 grand each. They're like, Brett, let's, let's go out. And I was in my 30s. Let's go out. Let's go to the W. I can't afford it, guys. We got you. Don't worry. We got you. You're, you make our night funner. If you're around, we have way more fun. So I loved that feeling. I loved my my friends shared the wealth. So when I started doing well, I shared the wealth. And I've done that with my clients for a while now. And I spoil them. When I moved to Vegas, I said, guys, I don't want to be bored. I bought a, a house with uh, four or five bedrooms. And whoever wants to visit, I'll pay for the flights. You'll have food covered. You, I'll pay for your Ubers. Just come visit me whenever you want. So I had I remember I had 54 straight days of visitors once, and then I'm like, this is too much. I want, <laughs> I like having three days off. So visit on the week, like Thursday through Sunday, and then I get Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off. But anyway, it's created my my second family with my clients, and and uh, it's been really f an, an interesting lifestyle. But then try to have a girlfriend when you've got all these, you know, I would yeah. like to have a girlfriend. I would like to have but it's really hard when I've got so many beautiful women surrounding me all the time. And I think that leads to a lot of the hate too. It's like, yes, I invented yes. the hip test, but also if you're tall, I think you get more hate. Yes. And also my lifestyle surrounded by bikini competitors. If anyone clicks on my story, they're like, wow, who is this? And I try to downplay it. I don't, <laughs> someone said you're like the. Yeah. I was going to say, who's the guy that upplays that is um, Dan Bazarian. <laughs> so someone said you're like Dan Bazarian, <laughs> but a gentleman, you mm -hmm. actually care about your clients. So I, I, you know, now I'm in Florida and it's, but I keep, I, I wanted to move away from San Diego because well, like I said, once you start killing, you don't care about taxes when you're a teacher making mm -hmm. 30 grand a year in Arizona and it's 6% and you get money back. Pay, yeah. You're, you're paying 1800 <laughs> and you care about it when you're making millions. And now the federal 
taxes are 37% for the highest tax bracket. The state is 13.3, yeah. business is 1.5, and that's not to mention property and sales taxes, but I'm paying 52%. And then the, back then during COVID, they were talking about a wealth tax, 1% per million. And I'm like, at one point, is this like socialism, like where you're just taking all my hard earned money. And again, I'm not selfish That's with my money. That's a fuck ton lot of money. Yeah. I mean, if you look at that, if you break that down. With the wealth tax they proposed, it was going to be 58%. And then another couple percent was sales and property tax. So it was going to be like basically 60% of my money. It's funny, like, you know. You Those are people you could, I mean, this is where I have problems with that. Those are people you could hire. You know, I mean, that, that's that's a lot of revenue that that's that has to be. I'm just running numbers. I'm, so if you, like for, five to seven, eight thousand a week. Well, so here's what I did. I, I said, if I move to Vegas, it's an hour flight away. Now, I'm not a party. I used to be. Now I'm boring. Um, but think about if we were back in our heyday, think how fun this would be. I'm like, okay, the the fifteen percent extra, yes. the thirteen point three percent, one point five business. So, so that extra fifteen percent, you know, let's just say you're making hypothetically four million a year. Fifteen percent of four million, you know, you're looking at six hundred thousand dollars. Well, divide that by fifty two weeks. So now you're going, I could literally spend like 12 grand a weekend, like 13 grand a weekend. If I wanted to be a, I don't, every I don't do weekend, that. every weekend, <clears throat> would you rather live in San Diego paying these taxes, having the beautiful weather or Vegas being able to spend like literally it would be hard to spend that much money. Yeah. If you were into cocaine and strip clubs and all that, but I don't. I didn't go out. I would stay at home. If my clients visit, I take them to STK or something for dinner. But like, still not twelve. No, apparently. no, it's, it's, <laughs> it's not. Not. I, but what I did is mm -hmm. I said, look, if I do this for three years, if I kind of suffer dealing with the heat, but I lived in Phoenix my whole life, I'm used to the heat. If I do this for three years, six hundred grand times three is one point eight million. I can buy my twin brother a home. And then if I do it three more years, I can keep buying my family members home and take care of every one of them. So I'm creating like generational wealth. Mm -hmm. And that's what my rationale was. So I wanted to move out of California for the tech. So I moved to Vegas, loved my house. I, I lived tw like 20 minutes north of the strip. It's c so peaceful. It's so calm. But I didn't open up a gym there. I thought, ah, I don't like the people here that I'm training aren't like the people from San Diego. They're kind of like opportunists. But every time I would visit florida like miami fort lauderdale tampa everyone would recognize me because they care about butts <laughs> you know my my friend sent me an image from uh the the an anytime fitness in in pompano beach and they have six hip thrust stations and two two squat racks but six hip thrust stations set up like benches with bar preloaded barbells yeah you know like th they, they so you literally found the butt capital of the world i did and people would be like <laughs> people would be like oh my god breck and church like they recognized me yeah. it felt good so i thought i'll open up a gym here but i'm not liking fort lauderdale as much it's just some like you live in london ohio it feels like home to you mm -hmm. i i don't i miss that feeling i keep moving thinking i'll find my place and it just doesn't what do you think like that home. place feels like? For me, like, I don't like, I mean, Fort Lauderdale traffic lights can be like four minutes long. Oh, you yeah. sit at traffic yeah. lights half your life. It's, I don't, I, 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 it's like there's theoretically what, what's the right amount of time for light, but every person you have to honk at them because they're on their phone because no one can sit there for four straight minutes. So everyone gets on their mm -hmm. phone and you have to honk. And then you, the like they, then only like five people go instead of 10 because that first person wasn't paying attention. It's so maddening. <laughs> and then you miss another light cycle and it's another four minutes because the person up front wasn't paying attention. So it's just things like that. And the humidity, I'm used to heat, but the humidity, you're always wet. Yeah. You know, your boxers are wet. It's like, I don't, there's certain things, but I wish I could combine like my gym in Fort Lauderdale is my favorite gym and I have a house on the water, but I'm not a boat person. I don't, I'm not the m best person with nature and all that. I'm a workaholic. Yeah. But I miss my Vegas home the most. My home in Vegas is, that feels like home to me. That's my favorite house. But then the people in San Diego, 
all my best friends are from San Diego. They're more real. They're just more, they're not opportunists. They're not just trying to use you. They're real, more, more, le- I, I won't say I haven't made friends because those took me years to build. But I just think some cities are more known for people just trying to climb. They want to succeed. You think if you lived in Hollywood, everyone's trying to become an actor, a model, you know what I mean? So you don't form as genuine of friendships. So I think I want to, I don't know what I want to do, but I never know what I want. Well, the San Diego, I mean, it's, I want to take a bathroom break, then come back and talk about the training that you had with those people there. I think that's going to be very hard to replicate because y'all went through something. The COVID, I know. That that was... We all talk about it. It was the time of our lives. Like, yes, it was so tragic. People are dying, but we had the most fun we were at because you weren't so productive, but you weren't mad. You were just trying to make it through another day, especially if you were in California where things were closed down for so long. I was like, you weren't worried about making a post on Instagram. You weren't filming your train. You're just trying to survive another day. I remember mm-hmm. going like, cause at first remember it was going to be, we're quarantining for 30 days and then another month, another month. So we were just trying to have fun. Yeah. And it was a really special time for all of us. Um, we did get so close. All right, let me take a piss yeah, real same, quick and then same. we'll come back. Okay. You guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a tabletop panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs. What I want to jump back to is during lockdowns, you had your, my brain just died, your squad, your yep. squad. And so now instead of having them, whatever their normal time, twice a week, mm-hmm. three times a week, now they, they all want to be in there because there's nothing to do all day, yep. every day which as a strength coach slash personal trainer, that creates a very unique situation because now you can do whatever you want to do at scale with almost full compliance. The only limitation I could see nutritionally, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about that. So let's just assume that their nutritional no, requirements. I can, I can handle that because okay. when, mm. I go, when I go to, when I go there in the morning, I, I go to 7-Eleven. It's, two doors down from me who wants a protein drink that's 40 extra grams of these you know yeah the 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 core power or the like that there's 40 extra grams so say they were only getting you know 80 grams a day now they're getting 120 they're closer to one gram per pound of body weight per day so it's like we would do we would a crazy fact that we'd have chugging contests and stuff with the so it's a protein but my, like my my niece gabby she was probably only getting like 60 grams a day. I start making her after a workout. You have to drink this. And she'd muscle it down. Now, some girls it can, aff- the way protein can affect their skin or their gut. But like, the point is, I, I, I made sure I provided them with protein and energy drinks. And because, like I said, I'm killing it. So I'm the most fun guy in the world. Who wants, get me a kombucha. Can you get me a bang? Can you get me a Celsius? get me a core power strawberry please like and so i I'd, I'd go to 711 you know i'd spend 80 bucks i'd come back with this <laughs> and yeah I'd set them on the reverse hyper <laughs> and then everyone's like yay and so i'm they're my my people it's so good so like i said people the trainers would be like why are you paying for them but they're my athletes people pay for sponsorships i don't sponsor them yeah. i just well this flattered. is this is interesting to me though because your phd right is in exercise science and then the the whole realm of strength and conditioning is it's kind of based upon one premise no matter what you're talking about except maybe bodybuilding and that is training economy 
Like, yep. don't do anything more than you absolutely have yep. to do. Now you're given a situation yep. and the knowledge of knowing, you know, of kind of where the edges are. Let's just say that they're edges. But now you have the ability to actually push the edges far because recovery really shouldn't be a problem because a lot of them probably aren't working. So sleep's not a problem. Nutrition's not a problem. It time's not perfect, a problem. Yeah, it's the most perfect environment. It's almost like Bulgarian shit, yeah. you know? So yeah. so now you're given this Bulgarian yeah. situation yeah. with no drugs. I mean, that's and, and all that. And by the way, I, I train, now especially I work with people who take stuff. My San Diego squad is all natural. Mm -hmm. None of them take anything. So it's like, I feel like, that's a skill set unto itself. It's like, I, th I think so many trainers, especially bodybuilding world, they only rely on, they don't know how to train people naturally. Um, it's a whole different world, even if you throw, you know, Anavar into the equation. But I get, my girls got so strong naturally my San Diego squad. But yeah, you're right. It was an idea. It was a utopia for a trainer. So what, 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 what was your, I don't want to say what did you do because that's too broad. What was the first mesocycle or whatever? So you realize, oh my God, they want to be here well, all the time. First, it was okay. Before when I did classes twice a week, I don't, it's me training 20 people at a time. I don't, I give them kettlebell deadlifts, you know? I, 20 people. I give them squats on the lever squat machine or heel elevated goblet squats. It's like, I'm having them get super strong on the hip thrust. They're doing squats, they're doing deadlifts, they're doing, they're doing very safe variations of them. I don't want them, I don't want 20 people alternating through the power rack, you know, where I can't spot them. Mm -hmm. So during COVID, the first thing I did was I started giving them actual squats and deadlifts. It was so much fun because my roots are with as a strength coach, but also just following all you guys, like I yeah. said. I was, I love all, you know, box squats, y you name it. I, I like, I like getting girls strong at squats and deadlifts. I missed it. So that's the first thing it is. I start giving them squats and deadlifts. And then I start training their upper bodies too. So before I was only training that they would do upper body on their own and I would do, I would just train their lower bodies. How did the upper body go over with them? Oh, I was like, God, these... <laughs> Like military press, I'd be like, all right. And then they, I'd go, let me see how many times you can get the barbell. They'd get six reps. Did you know? they want to do it? I guess. Yeah, they did. Okay, they, okay. They, yeah. And then I, they were doing it on their own. And it's just like when I started training my client, Tana Eubanks, back in the day. Um, Tana, um, she was doing all these types of pull downs. But she, I said, how many chin ups can you do? She said, I can do one. I'm like, Tana, you should be able to get 10. So I said, no more pull, no more pull downs. Let's just do chin ups two, three times a week. But every week I want you getting another rep. And in 10 weeks, she got 10 chin ups, but she'd take a picture, like, especially at the top of the chin up, she'd take a picture from behind of her back and she'd be like, look at my back muscles. So yes, we talk about volume. This is something I've never heard anyone talk about. It's kind of like with Nordic ham curls. Or maybe like you've seen it with the glute ham developer. If someone can't do one, it's embarrassing. You work so hard. Mm -hmm. You fight like hard, like like hell. If you can't do a chin up, and everyone else can do a chin up, you're working harder. You care more about it. So we can talk about like the resistance profile of a or like a seated leg curl versus a lying leg curl. But Nordics did more for my girl's hamstring development than anything because they'd see this girl can lower herself all the way down. And here I fall by, by the time I get to a 45 degree angle. They're working so hard at them. They're mentally concentrating. Tension is gonna be higher because you care so much. If you're trying to build your chin-ups up to 10, you care more compared to doing, theoretically the pull downs would be better because you're hitting all the angles and getting more reps in. But Tana's back developed more from stopping all that and focusing on progressive overload on chin-ups. So anyway, that's what I would do. I'd go, let's do chin-ups. And some people couldn't do them. So we'd start from the top and they just lower do eccentric only chin-ups. Military, I'm like, I want you to get in the bar for 20 reps. They'd get six. I'd be like, that's cool. Each week, let's try to add a rep. And then pretty soon my girls are all really strong. And then I'm like, we should all go on a trip together. It'd be fun. 
Well, there was this girl, Katie Sonier, in Miami who was really strong at the hip thrust. And I had my client, Carly Petritus, who was freakishly strong at the hip thrust. And at first, I was like, I want to see who's stronger at the hip thrust. But Katie, Katie doesn't like competing. She's just a fun person. She doesn't care about that. But I said, can we use your gym? And at first, I was going to have a hip thrust contest. But then I'm like, wait, I... I would like my girls to train for powerlifting too. It'd be fun to have them do squats, bench, and deadlifts, but also hip thrusts. But I'm like, wait, I also like, I've been training them hard with chin-ups and, and military press. So I said, so I, that's when I f said, look, we're going to do strong lifting. It's going to be six lifts. And the order, it goes squats first, then bench, then deadlifts, then military press, then chin-ups, then hip thrusts. So it's a long day. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And it's like, you know, the, the latest ones take 12 hours because everyone watches every lift. I don't have, you know, five different things going on. So, yeah, it'll, t it'll be a 12 hour day, but the girls will remember it the rest of their life because they're all cheering for each other. And I don't allow I'll have like 35 competitors, but they're all there supporting each other. I only do it once or twice a year. It's so much fun. But training for strong lifting. It's like, OK, when you're doing bench press and shoulder press, you can add in a ton of tricep work, um, especially if you're trying to hit both twice a week. But girls can recover faster. They can they can recover from it. Um, same with squats and, and deadlifts. You're doing squats and deadlifts. I can't add in a bunch of quad work. I can't add in a, a, a lot of extra you know stuff for the quads or things that are hard on the low back. So it's like, but the hip thrust is the one lift where you you're limited by what you can lock out everyone can hip thrust a lot of weight halfway up but that lockout so it's like the only accessory work mainly i was doing was extra lockout work for the hip thrust and then curls and rows for the for inverted rows and curls for the chin up because yeah i don't want to add in a lot of tricep work or quad work or things like that so it's like we would do basically you know, we, we had all different types of programs, but we tried the six day a week where you do one lift a day, like day one, you mm -hmm. do squats, day two bench, day three deadlifts, day four, um, military press, day five chin ups, day six hip thrusts. It's hard training six days a week, really hard. It's especially week after week, it catches up to you. So then we did, you know, two lower body days, two upper body days. We've tried all these different combinations, but it's been really fun seeing what transfers in women for example during the quarantine my like probably like six of my girls got stronger at the bench press because they're home doing push-ups all the time push-ups don't increase our bench you know if we just did body weight push-ups with no extra load for men they don't build the bench for women they do because it's closer to their you know, it's a, it's a heavier percentage yeah, yeah. of, you know, you know, so I learned, you know, we've been doing curls our whole lives, but a lot of the girls hadn't been doing any curls. I start giving them curls, their chin up goes up. And it's funny, we started doing a lot of band, band and chain work too, because now you take from the raw powerlifting world, don't use, use band and chains, <laughs> but then borrow from like Louie, and what you guys were doing and say, look, I can I can squat twice a week if one day is a f you know, like a free free weight and one day involves bands or chains. I can deadlift twice a week if one day is a heavy deadlift and the other day is like an RDL or a lighter stiff leg. Um, we can hip thrust twice a week, but each day you'll do hip thrust, but then you'll do some lockout work at the end banded add a add bands onto the barbell or do pause reps. And then with, with bench, it was like, yeah, you can do like one day close grip bench and then like a dumbbell seated shoulder press. And then the next upper body day, you could do bench press or, or like military press and then dumbbell bench or something like that. You could do two presses twice a week. They can recover from that. But I don't add in a lot more tricep stuff and all that. But then on those same days, they do chin-ups but I try to vary it. Like, you know, one day might be body weight chin ups for max reps, but then I get girls who, you know, can get to what they can almost get 20 chin ups. It's like, is, is that going to transfer their one rep max? Cause we're doing weighted chin ups, but it was really cool. Cause there's been two girls who have hit a 12 times body weight total 
meaning add up the six lifts, your one rep max. And with chin up, you add your body weight to it. Mm -hmm. So if you do a hundred pound, well, my, my top ladies are doing, Carly got a 785 pound hip thrust, but it's really hard to judge the hip thrust because most people do you should see doing like oh, i did an 800 pound hip they don't lock out mm -hmm. when you mm -hmm. lock out you know it you get full you can tell you can feel that pop you see it that pop it's really rare and she's one of like two or three people i've seen hip thrust that much weight that was in tulum it was such a, an awesome environment but so the top hip thrust was ever is i think 785 with with carly you know in our competitions Squatting, you know, these are all natural women that I think I've hit. I've had some girls hit like 335 deadlifts, 405. It's funny because I got about five girls close to that, but they always somehow get injured before the competition. So we've had to learn to tape, mm -hmm. taper off and not, you know, it's it gets hard to periodize appropriately and peak for it properly. Military press, the top military is like 135. But to get a hundred pound strict military press is is hard for, you know, like a a woman that weighs one twenty. You know, it's it's a feat. That's a good goal to work for a hundred pound military press strict. The chin up, uh, top chin ups are about seventy extra pounds. I've got two girls who have done that. I think seventy or seventy five pounds. Um, and you have to start from a dead hang. You have to touch your chest to the bar. It's not just getting yeah. your chin over the bar. Um, and so it was just a cool, you know, the average hip thrust strength amongst my, I think my top 22 girls was 550 pounds. We specialize in the hip thrust and that's why I'm, my squad is known for having big glutes, you know, but we do all the lifts. That's why when people bash me, do you know, we do squats and deadlifts. They act like all I do is hip thrust and bands. And it's frustrating because I, I think I've got the strongest all natural, female gym in the world and we would gladly be tested anytime um and it's a really cool group of girls but then it's interesting because now in fort lauderdale working with different clientele it's like um kind of it's just i love learning i'm always learning i'm always uh, maximizing my knowledge but I learned, I trained natural people for so long. It's, it, yeah. you have mm. to, it's such a, it's so important. So you don't just rely on drugs. I think so many people, they don't care about progressive overload. They don't care about that. They rely on drugs to build the muscle. And then all the women have these side effects over time. Their voices change and they're, it's like, it's unnecessary. You could have trained them without it. You could have gotten them there without it. And not 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 for bodybuilding or wellness, but for bikini certainly. And so it's just kind of frustrating seeing what some of these girls have been thrown into by coaches that just don't have the background that yeah. I do. They're not strength coaches. They're not. Well, the girls don't know either. They don't know either, right? So it's now with those six main lifts, they're being periodized the whole time. So, so it's yeah. So it's it's hard because um, when I start into when I'm there. I can, I try to say, let's, for example, the first time we did it, it's like, let's try to pick one, one the first lift we do, we're going to try and PR on. And it could be any PR. So I guess you would call it like the repetition method with West Side. But like, we're, we're trying to get, it could be a one rep max. So just think of the different loads. Yeah, for, it, for, yeah. for deadlifts, it could be max reps with 275, 315, 335, or, or a new one rep max. And I'd give them autonomy because they kind of know. You kind of know, like, I feel good today. I want to go for a new one rep max or I'm a little beat up. And I'd watch their warm-ups and I got really good at knowing their speed with how 135 and 185 looks when they're squatting. If, if it's fast and crisp, then they're strong that day. If it's grindy, then we're, we might still go for a PR, but it'll be like, a rep PR with 155 and they're going, they've hit 14, we're going for 15, but I'd keep track of all their PRs. Now that works great if it's a six, six week prep, eight week prep. But if you're doing 12 weeks, 16 weeks, you can't be PRing every yeah. single week It be on all the lifts. So I've learned to then, okay, we're going to do percentages of one rep maxes. 
And, but then the girls will always, they're just hardcore. You know, it's mm-hmm. so like you've talked about this straying from the program because we're all so hardcore. They don't, they don't, they want to take, the, especially their last set will be an AMRAP set. They don't want to put the bar down if it felt easy. They want to go to failure. If I say do 85% of one rep max for, you know, three sets of three, some lifts, it, the low that some lifts it doesn't that might work well for squats bends and deadlifts but like for hip thrusts it doesn't always work out mm-hmm. right same with same with military bits and then with chin-ups what do you mean 85 percent? <laughs> do you add your body weight into yeah, the total yeah. or not and so it became challenging but i really did figure out a good system and then i also wanted to talk about my system for booty by brett because i've never heard anyone periodize this way maybe you have um what i did with booty by brett is go i i I've always liked the hip thrust, but I want them to have variety. And I didn't know which exercise is best. Is it the squat? Is it the hip thrust? Is it the deadlift? I always thought hip thrust would be best. But we're always doing hip thrust. We're always doing squats. We're always doing, I, I like to say there's four main glute movement patterns. It's like you got your thrust and bridge movements. You've got your squat and lunge movements, like single leg or double leg squats. You've got your hinging movements like the RDLs and back extensions, and then you've got your abduction. And abduction can be frontal plane or horizontal plane. You can be bent over or straight up. So it's you're always including those movement patterns, but you prioritize. And the reason I started thinking this way is, all right, Dave, if I said you, during your peak, you got to set a squat PR in six weeks. Well, you would probably mainly squat and you'd be like, I'm going to kind of put deadlifts on the back burner. Yeah. <clears throat> if I said, Dave, what's the most chin-ups you've ever done? And you said, I've, I've done 14 reps. All right. I need you to get 20 reps in six weeks. Maybe you could have done it, but you would have had to start doing chin-ups like three times a week. Mm-hmm. And maybe you change the grips. Maybe yeah. you do one day body, one day loaded. But like you do that first. You do that. You do chin-ups first in the workout. And I kind of realized that it's like, it's really hard to, to, for me being 46 years old, I can still PR here and there, but I really have to prioritize that lift. For example, chin-ups, I could do it. I just have to start doing chin-ups first three times a week and hope I don't injure myself. So, yeah, yeah. so like I start thinking about the research I've seen on maintenance, you know, maintaining strength is easy. You can cut volume way down. So I started experimenting with the girls. Like I would have them do a single leg month, but they do one set of squats at the end and I'd see if they lost squat strength. Then I start doing no squats, just pure single leg stuff. And I know the powerlifting world won't because with powerlifting, it's so specific and the squat is so, but I'm talking about like general population. If general population hits Bulgarian split squats hard as hell and lunges and, and step ups, you don't lose your squat strength that, that much. You know, you might lose a little bit, you recover it within a few weeks. So what I started doing was I started saying, look, we're gonna periodize according to lifts. So m- month one was a well-rounded month. That's everyone's favorite because you can do all your lifts equally. So like I said, in strong lifting, my favorite six lifts, I do that with booty by breath. So month one would be a well-rounded program. So day day one would be like, say, squats and bench. Then we do a bunch, we do like seven lifts. And I throw an abduction for glutes because it's a it's booty, it's a booty program, yeah. but I want them to get the strongest version possible of themselves. So like three full body days. So say Monday would be squats and bench and then a bunch of other lifts. Wednesday would be hip thrusts and chin-ups. And then Friday would be deadlifts and military press. And then other lifts too. But you're giving equal focus on all six of those lifts kind of, you know. Mm -hmm. Then you just had a great month of training. Now it's time to specialize. Month two focuses on squats and bench. So like I said, if you're focused on squats, you're probably going to do squats twice a week and that third day you're going to start with it it might be a single leg squatting movement which guys like us might might not be able to recover from that like but the women can they can do like a back squat on monday a, a deficit smith machine reverse lunge on wednesday and a pause back squat on friday 
then they can recover. And then you still do, you're still doing hip, you'll do hip thrusts towards the end of the program for higher reps. And some, I'd have people say, I saw my best glute results on that month. So now after the month of squatting, what do you think is going to be sore on you? Your knees, maybe your hips, you know, it's a perfect time now for a hip thrust month. Now we focus on hip thrusts and chin-ups, okay? Because um, you just did bench press. Maybe your shoulders are a little... The girls don't get as beat up with upper body training as guys do. Mm. Then you just did a hip thrust month. Now everything's feeling good again. Now you have a deadlift month, deadlift and military press month. So you focus on that. You're still squatting. You're still hip thrusting, but it's on the back burner. You put more your emphasis, you perform. So with the deadlift month, though, you can't do deadlifts three times a week. But what you can do is have a hard deadlift day, a, a stiff leg deadlift day, and then a, a day where you do like barbell 45 degree hypers or dumbbell, like heavy, heavy 45 degree hypers and more hamstring work, you know? So then you're beat up. You're low, after the deadlift month, your low back's going to be beat up. You're going to feel fatigued overall. So then you have a single leg and dumbbell month. Now, you'd think for a powerlifter here in this, you'd be like, I'm going to lose all my strength during that month. But you've talked about it. I read every article you ever wrote back in the day about unloading, unloading some of the times. Uh, and it could be belt squats too. But it's like, yes, that month I've tracked it. They do not lose strength. But it's working out the imbalances. It's preventing. That month is critical and it's also brutal because like one set is actually like a set of lunges. You have to do two sets. It sucks. I hate yeah. single leg training. Um, but yeah, they do do single leg work and dumbbells. Sometimes I throw bilateral lifts in there, but the emphasis that's so the first couple lifts of the day are, you know, basically like a lunge, a step up or a, 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 a split squat. And then, you know, dumbbell pressing and stuff like that. More more dumbbell. Or just unique lifts that we aren't doing. Like, maybe I threw more push-ups in there or something. But, like, it's less, like, overall, it's less stress. It's more joint-friendly lifts. And then back around again. So, what what I will tell you about this program. Yes, it's a booty program. And I always, it's like back then, you know, it was like, well, squats probably and lunges probably build the lower glutes more. Hip thrusts more the upper glutes and then the abduction work hits the glute medius so it's a very good way to work the, to build glutes but you get very strong you don't get injured with this program too much because in powerlifting you're always trying to build your squat bench deadlift always focusing on all three lifts at a time very rarely do you put a lift on the back burner so i just thought it was an intelligent way to 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 periodize and i've never heard anyone we grew up reading about periodization. It was like, whatever, you know, volume starts high, intensity is low, and then they go like, but they never talked about exercise rotation, in my opinion. No, well, what there you did with the conjugate method, you rotated kind, ex kind of, but not like that. Not like that, not the focus. What, what this reminds me of is I spent, I did several sem or clinics with Mel Siff at his house. So I was fortunate enough to spend a lot of time with him. And when he was teaching me, you know, the intricacies of periodization, you know, how blocks should be focused on certain motor abilities, like strength, power, yep, yep. peak, explosiveness. And some motor abilities were able to be maintained for longer periods of time. You know, so if, if dynamic strength for one athlete, and it's, there's very individual variability, can be maintained for four weeks, then you can take a block and not even have it in there. Yep. You know, or if in some other cases, maybe you have a, a transitional block, you know, or just a movement. Uh, plyometrics every couple of weeks just to maintain anything to maintain that motor ability because that's not necessary during that time and that's looking at the big motor abilities where as a power lifter through west side and conjugate it's like what we're trying to build is a squat bench deadlift their top of the pie then we're concerned with, okay, we can't train those all the time because we're going to get burned out and all this other stuff. So what has the greatest dynamic correspondence to the squat bench and deadlift? They become max out for work, yeah. dynamic work, yep. and it flows down to train from there. So when I would consult with um, a football coach or some other sport, the first things I would ask would be, 
what movements or what motor abilities do you think from your own experience have the highest dynamic correspondence to the field? Yep. Is it a squat? Is it a clean? Is it, fuck, I don't care if it's a 10 yard sprint. I don't give a fuck what it is. You know, you've been coaching for 20 years. What is it? And then they would give me five things and it fucked me up because three things I can manage, <laughs> you know, as a, as a power lifter, you can manage how you're going to move those three things if through a conjugate or if it's just, you know, more bumpa oriented type of block, I can figure out how to manage three things, right? Five was like, fuck. Now, now what you just presented though is six things. And what you're kind of doing, if I'm understanding correctly, is you are using movements, but the movements are represent tend or represent yep. certain motor abilities, right? Yep. Is backing off of that and then stacking them in such a way that they don't have to be trained all the time, which to me is going to yield a higher outcome over a period of time, right? Yep. Because you can push it harder when you do push it. Right. Because yep. when it's being pushed all the time. Right. Say that with that first phase. And I think maybe this might have been what you were doing when you first started doing it and had six hours and could force feed protein down these people. Yeah. You can hit that that mezzo or whatever you want to call that first month repetitively for several months. And then what I'm going to guess is maybe they had a show or something that put a different variable that had to change the load in some regard. Yep. And then, so I guess what I'm saying is I'm intrigued, right? Because now my brain's like turning around with like what, with these coaches now it's, so with what you're doing, I completely understand what you're talking about. My brain keeps going. Cause I think we're a lot of strength and conditioning coaches fuck up is they try to make every exercise the specificity exercise, mm -hmm. or they try to just become too focused on this motor ability. And then they have nothing to use progressive overload to try to drive to get stronger on, right? So then they end up in this whirlwind of a four year time period that they have an athlete that they, I don't think they get as optimally as strong as they could be. Right now you throw in seasons and shit like that and it becomes a little bit different where, especially with this focus on specificity now, you know, all, all anyone ever does is their competition lifting their exact same manner. And I think career longevity has gone down. And I think that's also because of the trend and all the, well, you'll appreciate this <laughs> where <clears throat> when, and when I'll have conversations with some people and they speak about specificity, I like to say, um, I like to ask them back, especially of a competition lift, like specificity of what? Like, how do you define the competition lift? Let's let's agree on what this, this is what part of some of the problems that I think happen with a lot of coaches today. They don't agree on definitions first. So they just throw competition lift out. Yep. Cool. Because then I'll say to me, the competition lift is, you know, you have to take it out of the rack, walk it back, wait for a command to say squat yeah. squat down come back up walk it back in and that's a comp lift so yeah. if you do a double you're already one standard it's a one, it's a one yeah exactly you're one standard deviation yes. away from a competition lift. it's a comp is that exact manner you put yeah that's yes. pure specific and that's just on movement yeah we're not talking the other stuff right, right. right? Yep. so then the conversation will become how comfortable and how many standard deviations are you okay with saying that this is specific because you've already agreed that this one standard deviation of yep. doing a double or a yep. triple, you know, so how much room are we allowed to play here? Mm -hmm. And then, then it changes, right? Because yeah. all they're really doing is trying to find a way to make their stuff sound better than other people's stuff. And if they really believed in specificity pure, yes, then you would just do you once a week, you do a, a mock lip meet. <laughs> exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. Because the bench would always follow the squat. Yeah, right. So that's where it gets. That's where when I hear specificity, there's like so many horns that go off and my you know sirens and all this shit that go off because there's movement specificity then there's going to be contraction specificity you know there's, there's yeah I, I think you know how 
the pendulums always swing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Alan Costco was the first guy who really coined that. Like it goes here, and then West Side got so popular, then it just started getting criticized, and mm -hmm. and, and it sucks because I remember I think Dan Green wrote that classic article like like Louis would say things like the quads don't matter mm -hmm. in a squad or the pecs don't matter in a bench press. And clearly they do. He took things too far, but that was Louis. Mm -hmm. But Dan basically, basically said, I, 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 I did box squats. I got better at box squats and then was just murdered by people with these giant quads. And same with like bench, you know, I realize I'm, I'm not going to just do close. I don't know if he said close group or what, but basically I feel like then then everyone started going the opposite mm -hmm. direction. And, and also, yeah, raw powerlifting got way more popular. But now you have all these coaches who never learned that when someone can't sit back in a squat, they're so upright, you know, you need to give that person vertical shin box squats and good mornings and their squat will grow from that because you're not a versatile squat. You have to be, so you're all yeah. quad. You're all quad. And the second you lean forward a little bit, you dump the weight because you don't have that, I guess, that leaning torso strength, the hip strength, the low back, whatever it's called. But you prescribe those people vertical shin box squats to parallel and good mornings for six weeks, and then their squat goes up. You know, same with people that are leaning so much that good morning all their squats. Well, you give them safety bar squats, make them stay upright, don't let them shoot their hips up. So you have to, like, I, I'm obsessed with having this large toolbox. What, what happens when, remember when DUP became popular? Mm -hmm. Like, was it 10 years ago? D, everyone's now squatting three days a week. Low bar. Yeah. Low bar squatting three days a week. And all their arms are that arm, they called it the arm pain of death of the gym. I was that <laughs> pain right in here yeah. from low barring all the time. And I'm like, I remember telling this guy, I was like, do high bar squats, do front squats. And he's like, no. That, that's not specific though and I'm like, but you, it's ruining your bench press if your arms are killing from yes. low bar squats and then you go to bench press and the bar hurts like hell then you're not going to go up on your bench so if this they would have never done belt squats they were never focused on safeties you know it's like that's what you're missing out on so much variation that can there help is. you it's like the, the we went from being all about variety to then pure specificity whatever that it means. Go, it goes back and forth yeah. and it's i mean as, as a scientist you know this way better than i do is um things can work or not work for a multitude of different reasons you know so using the bands as an example is you know i've seen you know studies that said that bands are great and i've seen a lot of other ones they say well it doesn't mimic the strength curve right and okay let's just assume that's true it doesn't mimic the strength curve thus bands don't work and, and I've had this conversation with a few people and say, well, that's interesting because I didn't just use the bands with when I was at Westside with maximal loads. I used it with gen pop moms who didn't know how to squat because I couldn't teach them how to brace and stay tight when they took a bar out of the rack to squat with a broomstick. But I could put a mini band on there. And if they didn't stay tight, they, they, they figured out real quick how to stay tight. Mm -hmm. And then if they went to squat back up and they didn't have some intent, then they knew they needed more intent. So two things that are really hard to teach beginners and even young athletes are intent, compensatory acceleration, and tightness that just taught me. And normally the reaction is, fuck, never thought of that. Well, because maybe you are right. Maybe it doesn't work because of the strength curve, but maybe it's working because of these mechanisms or different mechanisms. We don't know. We just know that when people present it, when it first is done, they're saying, well, it's gonna work because da, 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 you know, five different things. Well, I mean, I fail at the squat towards the top. You see Ray Williams, he'll fail right at the top. Yeah. If he, I, I doubt he ever has done chain squats. <laughs> yeah. He well, that, that, that was the funny thing that was, because they would, this still makes me laugh when I see this, is the bands and chains, they only only work for geared power lifters because the, the gear helps them get off of the chest, yeah. right? And because of the strength curve. And <laughs> I've been around geared power lifting my entire life because that's really all that ever existed. Yeah. Where they miss the bench is the bottom, but not for the same reasons. It's because they can't touch. 
or they fall out of the groove. Yeah. But trust me, they're missing at the bottom way more than they are the top. So, yeah. and the squat, they usually miss out of the bottom because they're not sitting in the right position uh -huh. as they eccentrically go down. So either something eccentrically is going wrong or technically on the way down, yep. because what normally will happen is they'll fall over or they don't hit depth. So they can't go low enough. Either way, they're missing the lift at the bottom. So their own argument doesn't hold weight. But if, if don't, <laughs> I, I'm not saying just do chain squats. Yeah, what yeah, I'm yeah. saying is, do one day of regular squats, sure. one day of chain squats, or, you know, the, but also what happens when your clients start getting hip pain? Because FAI is real. Like a lot of the girls start getting hip pain. So that's when I say, all right, let's just do heavy chain loaded squats. So at the bottom, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, now it's only 185 at the bottom, but the top is now 285 and it doesn't hurt their hips. And so now you get to, so I had like Carly, I was talking about, she did just chain squats for like six to eight weeks and set a PR on her squat, her first raw squat, her first free weight squat. After that chain cycle, she hit 335 um, on her squat. And she built it by doing chain squats because she was squatting hard, pain free. And so people don't have enough skill set, like how yeah. to, it's funny, remember back in the day hearing like physical therapists be like, if someone's in pain, you refer out. We're always in pain. If yeah. you're a personal trainer, you have clients in various stages of injury all the time. We have to be many, not many physical therapists. We have to learn how to train around minor injuries and pain in our field. It just comes with being a personal trainer especially the older you get. I don't have a week that goes by where something doesn't hurt. But Everything I, hurts. But, yeah. but I can train around it. Yeah, you got to figure it out. Yeah. So, as you stated, and I want to circle back on that because it's, it's true, is they're all tools in the toolbox. And the, if, if I see any tool that's underutilized today, more so than probably in the past, it is just basic progressive overload. Yeah. Even if it's on the assistant type of work, they it, they need some kind of progressiveness there. The the mind muscle connection and the pump that matters. That matters. That's low end training. Like to me, that's bottom end training. Like you got the main work, the main strength stuff, and then the lower stuff. You're cycling a little bit different the way that you're putting it through there, but kind of probably still following the same but thing. But I've always focused on progressive overload. But that yeah. the problem is that requires a whole book. Because, all right, when you teach someone about like M Milo, uh, you know, like well, yeah, no, yeah, yeah, bowl, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that that makes so much sense. But in the real world, it's so much more complicated than that because you can't just add a rep a week. You can't just add five pounds a week. If you could get one more rep a, a month on chin ups, you'd be getting twelve more reps a year. It won't happen. Five more pounds a month is 60 pounds a year mm -hmm. you won't do that on all your lifts so it's more about recent prs you know like who cares what you did 10 years ago what are your recent prs with strict form and let's pick variations like what west side did, and let's try to beat them for a few weeks then let's switch to something else let's beat them for a month and then but it's not too far away from the these variations aren't so far away that it doesn't build you. So you're always building your squats because we're always doing squat variations. Yes. And we're doing single leg squatting work and we're always doing, you know, we're always doing the same movement patterns, but hopefully every six months you're a little bit stronger than you were before. Well, you just demonstrated with the way that you're cycling your booty by Brett, you know, you can cycle in a movement that's not that movement. You know, then that's progressively going because yep. you can't obviously you can't progressively overload. I mean, we'd all be God. Imagine how strong I'd fucking be. I started at twelve. Yeah. Oh my, I'd be benching. There's not a thousand. A, there's not bars big yeah. enough. You know, <laughs> unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Um, but one thing you said is is critical is um, <clears throat> got to be realistic about where you currently are. Right. Especially as you get older, you know, it, it sucks, you know, but I can't like rpe becomes weird rir becomes weird fucking percentages are not even part of the mixture you know it's just like what what's doable then how long for my main lifts like how long can i progress 
And then, then this is one of the questions I got from my Discord server as well. Sometimes if I put a movement in that I want to progress on for three weeks, sometimes I got to add like three weeks before that of almost a regression. I'll just do it at a slower tempo. Uh -huh. I find some way to make it harder yeah. instead of just the classic yep. sets and reps. Just because yep. I know I need more than three weeks out of it uh -huh. where the question that was asked was if we're dealing with a glute bridge or a lot a lot of the glute movements that you're talking about but probably more so with the glute bridge what are the regressions because it's easy for people to see the progressions right but where how how does it, where do you regress well you just start everyone can do a body weight glute bridge yeah you would help. everyone <laughs> everyone can do a body weight hip thrust so yeah you start with body weight and lately i've been going back to body weight and if I concentrate super hard on squeezing the top as high as you can go, and I just do little pulses, and I do that for 10 reps, squeezing, squeezing a full hip extension, try it, try, try it off a bench and just really drive your hips as high as you can. You're, chances are you're missing those last two inches and you go up all the way and just squeeze for a second and then come down. Do a set of 10 which is body weight, you will feel your glutes from that you will feel them a lot so it's like it always starts with body weight a lot of my beginners i would say they start with like 65 pounds you know they're athletic women but they maybe they've never done a hip thrust before i might have them do 65 pounds for like sets of 12 to 15. it doesn't matter though because i'm going to be giving them hip thrusts you know as if they come to me twice a week or three times a week they're always going to be doing hip thrusts and it might start off with body weight or barbell, but yeah, I'm very interested in getting them to 135 so that they can have a big, they can roll the yeah, bar over yeah. them. They, once you can roll the bar over, it's so much nicer than having to be handed a bar or sit down with it. So once they can do 135, but now we have the glute drive machines that are making things so much easier. Now is the rise of the machines. It's like setting up a barbell hip thrust in a gym sucks. Mm -hmm. No one wants to do it. I would do it after I did, when I used to train at commercial gyms, I'd do it after I deadlifted. So the plates were already there, but it sucks. So that's why these machines are so nice, but the machines they make f too big <laughs> for, they fit men, yeah. not women. Well, that's the problem with this. I'm kind of in that. You got to fit people that are five, five to six, five. You know, I mean, there's a It's funny you said that. Cause you I know, say hard, for, man. for my BC strength, that's five foot. Five, yeah, foot five, five foot to six yeah, four. Yeah, because no, women, I mean, yeah. you can. Five yeah, foot yeah. to six foot can be done. It's just hard, but yeah. no one tests out the five footers. So you know all these women who want to, and, and they're they're on these glute drive machines, and their yeah. knee angle is obtuse, and they're feeling in their hamstrings. And all you had to do was move that foot plate back this way. So anyway, so like the the with the glute drive machines now it becomes a lot easier because you could start off that the the like on the hammer strength the, the starting weight is 45 pounds you know you get them using that then you throw a 25 on each side etc but for regressions like not everyone could do a single leg hip thrust right away so you might do b stance or you might do two legs up one leg down but very quickly Within a, if you're pushing hip thrust hard, within a few months, most people can be using 225. It's just like it's the it's the environment though. Glute lab is for hip thrust what West Side was for for squats. And, yeah, you know what I mean. Or like an Olympic lifting center has all these squat like squat platforms and uh, you know squat squat rack, uh, squat stands platforms. You're going to be doing Olympic lifts and squats if you're an Olympic training center. If you're at a powerlifting gym, you're doing squats and deadlifts. If you're at Glute Lab, we have, uh, you know, 20 glute benches, and then we have got two hip thrusters and then some machines. So we've probably got 16 different hip thrust stations. You're and you're looking around and you're seeing these girls with huge glutes doing 315 for 20 reps with good lockouts. You're not impressed with your 185 for six, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like it's that community, it's that environment. You're watching everyone. You're going, oh, so you push harder. You push harder, and within a few week, few months, all my girls are using 225 for reps. And my ultimate goal is to get. I always tell them, even if they're small, I want you getting 315 for 20. Not everyone gets there, but it's a good goal to hit. It's hard. Yeah. When you were <clears throat> working on your PhD 
and then after when you were in when, when you were in your deepest phase of research because now i know you fund research as well yep. so when you're in your deepest phase of research what were some of the things that you were hoping to find and then some of the things that were more disappointment more disappointments it's just training studies like they're so hard and so few so it's like cool we can do stuff on force plates and emg and dynamometers and we can analyze mechanisms to death but you really need training studies and they're so hard to carry out they're so time consuming so that's where i just wish we could just be funding training studies left and right because those figure out what actually happens I love, I geek out on the mechanisms, but, right, you know, does EMG predict hypertrophy? Our last study shows not really because it doesn't take into account the stretch, the passive forces. So it looks at active forces, but not passive. So it's like, it could be valuable. We need a caveat there. And it's like all the functional anatomy. So you can look at things and go, well, muscle should do this or, but does it, does the, does what we think predict when looking at the muscle the skeletal the skeletal system the musculoskeletal system does the nervous system behave exactly how we would think so you need more training studies that's the main thing and it'd be cool if every every exercise had so many training studies behind it we could have review papers saying here's the 30 studies yeah. conducted on this here's what we know so far but at the end of the day do any of the squat studies apply to what louis did what you do here, do the hip thrust studies apply? Because I'm better at teaching the hip thrust than the, than the yeah. researchers are. And you're better at teaching. So it's that's what I wish people understood. Like <laughs> anecdotes matter. If you have a world-class system, a world-class coach, you're going to do things a little differently and the system works, but it revolves around the coach. Yeah, well, I think that... Real quick, Dave, I got yeah. two, two minutes. Uber's coming to get me. Okay, okay, cool. I think I'm going to miss my flight. All right, so <laughs> how, would you, how would you sum up, you know, your, 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 your let's go with the periodization thing because that was one of the biggest things. How would you elevator pitch the periodization model that you use with the body by Brett because that was the most intriguing thing for me today? I would say prioritize lifts. And put the lift on the back burner because guess what? Look at the the Smolov and um, and and Shiko and stuff. Like sometimes when you prioritize the squat, some people's deadlift goes up, especially if you're doing grip work and stuff to keep your grip strength. So don't always think you have to have, you know, you can you can put a lift on a back burner and maintain strength very easily, but to build strength. It requires focus and specialization. So sometimes instead of trying to focus on all three lifts, hell, you got all year to train. Take them, take two months where you just try to focus on your squat and then switch to the deadlift for a while, you know, and keep the squat on the back burner instead of trying to always build all three lifts and, and, and all the accessories too. It's like pick some accessories that you know, transfer to your deadlift and prioritize those over the squat, you know, and then watch your deadlift climb. Throughout the year, maybe you gain more strength doing it that way than trying to hit all three of them equally all the time. It's a good thing, and uh, Brett, I appreciate your time. Thank I appreciate you what so you've done much. for the industry. Yes. I appreciate you, you coming out, and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, and Dave, I just wanna say you helped my training big time, so you've helped me as a coach, and you've helped so many people like me through being so generous with your articles and your teaching, so. It's a it's an honor and a privilege to be here. All right. Thank you guys. We're done. You guys are selecting Merrick for your telehealth platform needs. They have a couple different ways that they go about doing this. The first is through a self-selected experience. So there's a tabletop panel, which is the full panel. That would be the panel that I personally get twice a year. That's checking everything. You name it, it's all there. The other panel is a checkup panel with a guided optimization. You're connected with a patient care coordinator and the patient care coordinator will meet with you to determine what your needs are. Thing to be able to help optimize your health or mitigate without judgment. So the discount code again is Table Talk Merrick Health for all your hormone optimization and performance needs.